what is up everyone welcome back to another lube review space if you haven't already give us a follow here at lube reviews uh, check out the youtube channel on the uh the link tree which will lead you to all the wonderful links that is this show uh today we have some uh, well, really cool guests uh, who's been here before uh, but today we're gonna dive into his wonderful book collection this is gonna be the first of many many series like this uh, so i'm looking forward to learning specifically today about mead lane and mark probert uh so let's go ahead and bring up our co-hosts uh matt let's let's introduce you first this is this is about your uh your book collection and primarily we're going to be talking about me lane and mark probert today but uh, what's going on man how you doing what's up everyone and uh, can you hear me yep we hear you okay cool yeah um i i don't know like uh i i i have a very odd eclectic book collection going back to the early 40s when it comes to ufology contact you stuff and I don't know. I think that's where uh, a lot of this starts. I think um, with any kind of religion, people should know the roots of it. And I think knowing the roots of it, whether they agree if it's a religion or not, they should understand what their belief system is based on. So, yeah, that's kind of what this is about, I guess. Um, I'm more interested in hearing what Craft Beard has to say about stuff, to be honest with you. But, yeah, that's it. Did the weeks disappear, or? Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I've got to remember to unmute my mic here on this thing. I was actually <laughs> saying hello to everyone who's here. Uh, I was giving a shout out to James Carrion, Laura, UFO Shane, Matthew, uh, Laura, Lindsay, excuse me, Lindsay Pinter, Derek, VR Don, Lil Pop Tart, and we've got Steve Long also as uh, part of the panel. Um, so yeah, Craft Beard, what's shaking, man? How you doing? I'm doing. Here. I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing really good. I've I've taken like almost a week off of the topic, so it's been really nice. The, the Memorial Day weekend has kind of given me the excuse to not look or really do much of anything here in the last week. Uh, so it's been kind of fun to sort of check in here and there and see what's going on. I see there's, there's going to be a lot of fun stuff to talk about tomorrow. That's for sure. I've done the opposite. I've been <clears throat> really engaging with spaces. I've been doing the opposite of what you've been doing. I was just listening to Anjali's, and I'm glad I, that I had to leave for this because it's just infuriating. Oh, is she doing a space right now? Yeah, with uh, Fringe. Oh, wow. That's, I'm man. jealous, man. Like, why Yeah, I didn't know. <laughs> Shit, if I had known, I might have scheduled this for a different time. <laughs> I'd love to go in there and just mess with her and ask her some questions. Uh, but that's cool. Um, that's fine. Look, it, it, people always claim they want to talk about stuff like this anyway, but let's see if the, they're willing to put uh, their money where their mouth is. But with that said, Steve Long, how you doing, man? Thanks for being here. Yeah, sure thing. How's everybody uh, doing? Glad to be here. I've also kind of taken like a week off uh, with Memorial Day weekend and stuff, and I've kind of been off the topic for a week. It was a nice kind of break, but uh, I'm glad that you're doing this um, today. I've really enjoyed, uh, you know, some of the recent spaces that you've had with good guests, good, like, productive conversation, uh, really something uh, different. I usually am not a fan of spaces. And I really think that it's uh, cool. I'm excited to see uh Everybody here tonight and listen to Matt and uh, Craft Beard. And uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, no sweat. Um, all right. So, Matt, where do you want to start with Mead Lane and Mark Prober? Who do we start with first? And, and you know, I guess we'll eventually get to how these two guys sort of uh, are, are the starting point for modern ufology. Is that fair to say? Um, at least for, for contactee, modern ufology, stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, it, it, essentially, it all starts with Mead Lane. Um, he was a uh, like he, he was a big fan of Blavatsky, and a lot of people. I mean, I I always assume that most people know who Madame Blavatsky is, um, but if you don't, yeah, can go it, ahead. Can you give us a, a quick rundown of who Madame Blavatsky is? I mean, with a name like that, I'm assuming she's got a crystal ball in front of her. But please, I mean, pretty much, she was a, a theosophist. Um, you can still find like theosophical libraries out there. 
there used to be one in San Diego I would go to, and you could like go in there and read all their books about um, it's it's just early occult practices, like whether it was you know Aleister Crowley and the Golden Dawn, um, you know Madame Blavatsky and her Theosophy, and uh, all the esoterica, um, trying to find and, and discuss the hidden planes of Earth, you know. Um, it, it was all along those kind of those ideas, talking to the ancient masters, as it were. And uh, Mead Lane was a big believer in all of that stuff. Um, he was a big fan of Charles Fort, who wrote The Book of the Damned. And yeah, more people might be more familiar with uh, Fortean Times or the, the topic even being called Fortean. It was named after Charles Fort. And he was essentially just kind of like, I would say, like a lot of us. Um, just really interested in the paranormal and shit you should like that people don't want you to know about or that, you know, like banned books, um, knowledge that's not easily accessible, I would say. And he was fascinated by the topics like that and uh, had had the 14 Society, which was a group of people that would, you know, go research all this stuff. And um, yeah, so Mead Lane started kind of uh, trying to mimic a little bit of the 14 society type stuff. Um, early on, and when I say early on, this is going to be predating Roswell. Uh, it's predating the Kenneth Arnold uh, sighting, which was Mount Rainier, Washington, which is probably like one of the most famous, you know, a lot of people refer to that as the start of ufology, uh, the Kenneth Arnold sighting or Roswell in 1947, the big quote unquote flap of 1947. But this really started in 1945 um, as, as it pertains to, to Mark Probert and Mead Lane. And uh, these two fellas, I guess you would say, met. Um, Mark Probert had a wife named Irene. And when Mark would sleep, she would say that he would speak in other languages sometimes and, you know, talk out loud. And she interpreted this as something like he was talk, contacting, you know, or being like a medium, contacting ancient souls. And uh, in 19, I think it was 1945, there was, let me, let me get the right date here so I can quote it correctly. Womp, 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 womp. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was 1945, or I'm sorry, 1946. It was reported that there was like a, a, a number of people in San Diego that believed that a UFO ship came behind a meteor and made contact with several people. And um, Mark Probert claimed he was one of these people and had written into Mead Lane about it. And his description of the UFO craft is pretty fucking awesome. Hold on, let me get it. Uh, 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 where is it? Basically, essentially, he said that it looked like it was a big hit. It was a big, uh, a big object the size of a plane that had flapping wings. So let's like people's like idea of some bird. of the earliest UFOs. Yeah, like a giant bird. Like it's staying in the air because it's flapping its fucking wings, right? So, um, in talking to Mead Lane, Mead Lane kind of started talking to Irene Probert, and they got the idea that, wow. Mark is is contacting these people from other realms of the of the universe, and uh, the first one was a, a man named uh, Martin something Langford something rather. I, I my it's been like three years since I've read a bunch of this. Um, Martin Langford Latifor something like that, who was a a showman from New York. Uh, that was one of the first people he spoke to. But later on, there were people with names like Yada D. Shiite and all these other mystical people. And essentially, they were giving him the key to the universe. So this is this Why is pre the this work. is pre Roswell. This is pre yeah. Is this pre or post war? Um, this is I guess I don't know. 1945 during okay. the war, so, right after. Right after so it's no, no, right yes. after after the just war. Just yeah, post yeah. war. Yeah. Uh, so just post war, yeah. right before the the whole Roswell happening. So like what, like basically like a two year, three year period then. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And 
and you know like everybody always talks about the flap of 47 but like 45 46 people were really really jumping into this topic whether it was people you know doing seances again mead lane was super into seances well, I know and trying to contact they were, people that they way were like when, when you say they they were having like meeting groups right like the boy scouts yeah like at people's houses yes. And that's how they yeah, were meeting and, and sort of sharing ideas on this. This was obviously pre-internet. Like, do you know how these these people found each other? What was like a, like the common ground where they would find each other? So uh, Mead Lane had a newsletter. And originally there were like 15 to 20 subscribers for the first newsletter. And it was called the Round Robin Newsletter. And uh, they're really fucking hard to find today. And if you do, they're shitloads of money. But, yeah, that's how, like, he was reaching out to people slowly through his round-robin newsletter. And slowly, they ended up changing the name to the Borderland Research Sciences Association. And that became much, much bigger and um, became the foundation for a lot of, like, you know, the the Eisenhower meeting with the aliens. Shit like that came from the BSRA. Yeah, okay. Um, just publications. It just did. fascinates me that some of the early descriptions in 1945 that's like early quote early uh the, the descriptions with were, were being ships that were flapping like yes <laughs> like, wings flapping they couldn't they couldn't think of anything i guess in the zeitgeist or why do you think they chose flapping that sounds very biblical i mean i i don't know like because they at the same time they weren't really thinking of it in terms of aliens coming from other planets they were more of the idea of like maybe even um, uh, Jacques Vallée style interdimensional type beings, you know, like that that whole mindset. Right. They were coming from other realms of the, you know, uh, there's, there's an actual word and I, I can't remember it off the top well, of my head. This is definitely pre uh, Twilight Zone. Yeah, you yeah. Um, that's cool. Okay. And, so, and yeah. There's an there's a real quick. There's an amazing record out there. Um, it was called Mystic Magazine Record, and you can like if anybody listening has this, get at me because I want a copy. And it, it's it's a vinyl vinyl record, and it's Mark Probert like doing trans medium stuff as one of like the the uh, main founders of the dimensions that Yada D Shiite person. And I've always wanted to hear it, and I've never heard it. Wow, that's cool. Well, I, I yeah, can already yeah. tell that this conversation I'm going to put up on YouTube and my podcast. So if you're listening on YouTube and podcast, please like, share, subscribe, and leave a comment, rate, review. Um, dude, that is so cool. Um, okay, so then how did this, how did Mead Lane, this Mead Lane, Mark Prover uh, meet up? Then what ha- so what, what else happened pre-Roswell? And then I guess we could get into what happened post Roswell because I can only imagine if this group was already growing through this newsletter and what was the the, the the more scientific sort of official name that they changed it to again the borderland re or border I always get it backwards borderland sciences research association and it was based out of San Diego science research association that is wild okay so okay continue yeah so what they would refer to this stuff as were the ether ships, the UFOs. They would refer to them as ether, ether ships. ships. Wow, ether okay, ships coming from ether- like Etheria, yeah. you know, like it almost sounds like Eternia from like she right, or some right, shit. But right. yeah, I'm trying to think what but, what was in what was in the public ether. I, I'll look it up while you're talking. Sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. Yeah, no, it, it's fine. Um, but as as Roswell happened, you know, as as UFOs started to take hold, that's when like the BSRA or BR BSRA started doing stuff like about the flying discs and started referring to them as flying discs after Kenneth Arnold, um, after Roswell, they really really clung on to the flying disc situation, and again, he Mark Probert was still doing these channelings. And he was doing them up, you know, 30 years on and um, started his own, I, you know, like, I'm sure people will get pissed if I use the word cult, but it was called the Circle de Cathra. And what was weird was like how I even ran into any of this was I bought a big collection from an old collector 
um, that used to go to meetings in the 40s and 50s that was a part of that cult. And in there, I have a lot of like the letters him and Mark Probert would write back and forth to each other about their families. So that's when I was first like digging into it. I was like, who the fuck is this? What kind of weird cult shit is this? And yeah, that's that's kind of how I came into uh, learning about it. And as I did, I realized that there were other people that were kind of fascinated by this topic that there were there was stuff that was predating Roswell. There was predating, you know, the Kenneth Arnold sighting. Um, well, yeah, I'll just say know. this. In the 20s, 30s, and 40s, especially the 20s and 30s, ether was a drug that people would use, and the effects of uh, the intoxication were like alcohol, similar to alcohol. Um, oh, yeah, they'd use it for surgery. Yeah, but also MD, M- NMDA antagonism. The user may experience distorted thinking, euphoria, and visual and auditory hallucinations in, at higher doses. So, I mean, like, yeah, it could be just that's where they pull it from. So, because I'm trying to think of like the ether, that's such a fun way to sort of describe the other beings, you know, and, and the closest thing to it would have probably been this drug. Because uh, if you if you fast forward to the, today, I think something that's very similar that rings very, very similar is the discussion to, with MDMA. And the beings that people, oh, yeah. people see when they use MDMA. Uh, so that's that's interesting. Um, go on. I'm sorry. That, that so was here, fun. Here's, here's, here's a really good quote on um, ether and the etheria. Um, and it comes from, let me get the right, uh, wearethemutants.com, which they did like an amazing job researching Probert, um, Mead Lane. It's a great site. Like if you want to delve in further on it. Um, in late May 1949, responding to Walter Winchell's claim, Walter Winchell was like another uh, famous ufologist back then, uh, claimed that UFOs were actually experimental guided missiles from Russia. Lane told a newspaper reporter that the saucers, in fact, originated from a place called Etheria. This was not a place that was part of our own physical realm, but a material world with objects and people and a great civilization. And it lies all about us, though invisible and untouchable. So, yeah, like, it was the interdimensional hypothesis before that was, like, a, a term. Which, like, I do I do attribute a lot of that to Jacques Vallée making that more popular during our time. But, yeah, they were making so it popular can, okay, during can that Can you time. explain that sort of link right there? How does Jacques Vallée sort of piggyback off of this? Because you just mentioned him, so I'm kind of curious... Like how do you how do you make that connection? What what is it about this stuff that you also see in Valet's work since we since you mentioned it? So so Valet wrote a lot about like um uh not he he was like almost like a, a countercultural thinker in some ways when it came to ufology, in my opinion. Like he wasn't always about nuts and bolts. And that was a lot of the typical thinking during the, you know, forties, uh as post Roswell that these things were coming from other planets. But he was, uh, what books, was like Revelations. There's a, there's a trilogy that he did. And he talked a lot about it being possible interdimensional. And he didn't understand why people didn't understand that maybe this wasn't a, a, uh, a way to teleport from one planet to the next and that they were doing flying long distances this way and that it was, in fact, interdimensional. And I don't know that, like, he got his ideas from Mead Lane or anything like that, or if he developed this on his own, but like, it really wouldn't surprise me. Like the, the, the research was out there. This stuff was out there. It was big. I mean, uh, you know, Mead Lane would be writing in, you know, they'd take his writings and put it in fate magazine, which was huge back in the day. So, yeah. So if you could compare Mead Lane to somebody today, would it be almost like a modern, Greer. Modern Greer, really that big. Yeah, yeah, that absolutely. Influential. For first time, first time, that influential, definitely. Wow. Uh, so then... And it's just been dropped, you know, kind of lost to history. So then what happened post-Roswell? How did this guy go from Etheria, and what changed uh, post-Roswell? No, nothing really changed other than the fact that they were more trying to interpret flying discs into their already pre-existing... Uh, spiel that they were trying to spit like they just tried to work it into what was already there like people 
oh, you think this is nuts and bolts, but let, let me tell you more about these things. Uh, they're not just they're not just beings from another planet. You know, these are these are wise, great leaders and, and we have the info for you. And, and let me transmedium the shit out of this and, and explain what they have to say. Um, there's long, long, like, papers of just trance shit that Mark would just spit nonstop. Um, who's that dude that does it now? Bashar? Are you, are you familiar with Bashar at all? Bashar. Is he the guy... He's like, he goes, hello, how are you today? Like, oh. <laughs> talk, okay, no, I'm thinking of a different guy. Yeah. Then. It's not Bashar, it's somebody yeah. else. I forgot the dude's real name, but like, it's a dude that, uh, Daryl Inka was his name, I think. And he channels an alien named Bashar, and he totally changes how he speaks. Like his, the pentameter of, it, of his vocals. It's great, it's great. If you haven't seen it, it's totally worth watching, because it, it's, it's funny as fuck. But yeah, I... I you know, that's kind of how these guys do, right? How are you going to call bullshit on a guy channeling something? Right, yeah, because there's, the, well, especially at that time, there's no sort of scientific way to, yeah. to... Well, I mean, this guy's doing this currently. Right. And, like, people, like, I mean, it's not, to me, it's not much different than than Angeli, you know? Or Anya <laughs> Dalai, however you pronounce it. You said Angeli, that is great. That is great. Uh, Andreas, I noticed that you put something here in the nest. It's a list of resources compiled for today's topic. Uh, what did you uh, throw in there that you found relevant? Shane, I see your request. We're going to we're gonna keep the first hour with uh, Matt and just sort of, sort of go through the Probert uh, lane history. And then as soon as uh, that's over, we're going to open it up to questions to everyone. So, uh, so we'll get you up there. Don't sweat it. <clears throat> I put in a, a bunch of stuff primarily related to dissociation and hypnosis and the way that transmediumship works. Um, but I also included the links that, um, is it Matt? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that Matt sent me with some highlights um, of, of specific parts that I highlighted because they're, they're really relevant. So one, one thing that Matt mentioned is that Lane initially suggested to Probert uh, that he established telepathic communication with what was described as a bullet-ish winged structure that appeared over San Diego for an hour and a half. Yeah. Um, so Lane saw those craft and he then asked Probert because he was already doing mediumship, if he could telepathically communicate with them the same way that he had communicated with spirits in the past. And surprise, surprise, it worked. Um, but then Lane, added on t onto what um, what Probert wrote or said. And he said, uh, Lane insisted that there were no contradictions among the material that Probert collected, only refinements. Lane finessed his description into something more akin with his own theosoph theosophical theories. The flying saucers and their inhabitants came from another plane of existence, a denser one, and only reach our own world by changing their vibrations. So already you're seeing how Lane is rewriting or reinterpreting what Probert was was uh, getting through his trans mediumship, and I think that's a really good illustration of like uh, a predecessor to to Jack Ballet's um, interdimensional hypothesis. And then, yeah, just a bunch of links of other related stuff that we can talk about later. But um, yeah, it's a really cool case. I'm really, I'm really interested in what you have to say about like trans mediumship and your opinion on it. Like, cause it, it, like there's only so deep you could go into the Probert thing before you're essentially, you, you end up just reading the bullshit that, that he spit, but it's really not that interesting because it's, it's word salad for the most part. But I'm really interested in like what you think was going on there. Obviously like his wife, when he met his wife, she told him like, you know, we're going to make we're, I'm, we're going to change history or, or something to that effect. Like, we're, like she had a purpose, you know, along with Mead Lane and them bringing this out of him. What do you, what, what's your theory on all that? Like with trans mediumship and what's going on there? <clears throat> um, I, I feel like I sound like a broken record at this point. This is another example of the dangers of the hypnosis. Um, so uh, in one of the links, uh, it mentions it was Lane who convinced Probert that his nocturnal mumblings could be evidence that he was in fact a trans medium. So prior to finding out that, uh, that Probert talked in his sleep, Probert had never considered himself being a medium. It's not until 
Lane suggests it to him that, that the possibility even occurs to him. That's right. And then um, a little while later, Probert recalled that after being instructed to relax, he soon found himself in a state of euphoria so intense that he lost all awareness of the world around him. When he regained consciousness, he was told that he had been in a trance for some 45 minutes and had spoken it in a voice not his own. So very clear, obvious case of um, Lane hypnotized Probert. The suggestion may have occurred when he suggested that he may be a trans medium or because we don't have a transcript of what happened during this specific session, he may have offered suggestions during this trance that Probert could not recall because hypnotic amnesia is a really common thing that happens. So I think uh, indirect or direct or self-hypnosis and self-suggestions led to Probert essentially uh, displaying all of the characteristics of what was being suggested he should display. So if you believe that you're a trans medium or that you, you have the ability to channel something and you be, you're you hypnotized and you're highly hypnotizable, that is exactly what you're going to find. You're going to find the unconscious mind responding to that suggestion the way that it thinks um, you should. And this is a really good example of you. someone gets hypnotized and depending on the subjection, uh, suggestion that you give them, a bunch of entity, seeming entities come out that, that, that sound like real people. Um, I think this is a really good example of dissociation and hypnotic suggestibility. Um, yeah, and I, I can go uh, on if you, if you want, but I'm curious if, if Lou has other questions or, or, or if you do. Uh, Matt, did you, did you have any follow-ups? Because I, I got a couple. Yeah, go, go ahead. Uh, well, no, no, I'm just I guess, Well, my, so this whole transmediumship, you know, it's just funny. I just, to me, all I see is the, the, the mechanisms and the gears of a scam going on. And I guess before the UFO thing, it was spirits, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. What was, was there anything before spirits or was that sort of like, like a... <laughs> A, a, you know, a trick up the sleeve for centuries. No, it's been <clears throat> it's been around for centuries. Uh, spirits, demons, whatever. I don't think it's a scam. At least Probert, I don't think was pretending. I think maybe Lane was a really savvy business person, but I don't think this is a case of a scam in the sense that he's deliberately acting as if uh, he's channeling. This is exactly what you see in. Uh, uh, hypnotherapy context um the, what right, you but, ask but, for but at that time right he's pushing a mm -hmm. newsletter he's pushing like a message to sort of they're having meetings with like-minded people and i'm sure they weren't poor like-minded people and they were probably you know roaming around in pretty upper social circles uh you know spinning this this sort of this this possibility no yeah i guess I, I have absolutely no problem um acknowledging that people can believe their own bullshit and it's not always that they're deliberately lying or running a scam i think people who have uh esoteric interests like these can have those interests believe them fervently and also have a side business of promoting the those beliefs without necessarily willfully lying to people you know, I also, when you say that, I got to check. I always think of myself and I, <laughs> like, when I was making good money and I was talking about this in a way that I thought was positive, I thought I was also doing the right thing. But really, I was just, I was, I was, what would you call that? Unknowingly doing something like that. I don't want to call it a scam because I wasn't trying to scam people. Um, but but I was definitely making money on something that I thought was real. Well, it's like proselytizing, right? right. Like you, any kind of religion. Right. Like Jesus is real. You need to find Jesus. He's made my life better. You know, like it, it goes so many levels. Yeah. But I mean, I don't know. I feel like there's also a point, And I've said this many times too, where, you get to a crossroads in the discussion or in your belief, not even the discussion, in your belief. I, I feel like everybody hits this crossroad where they're like, 
okay, something's not right here. <laughs> and they, they, they acknowledge it one way or another to themselves. They know what the truth is. But, and then they make a decision to either lean into the prophesizing or lean into, you know, kind of like what Houdini and a few other uh, uh, masters of their trade when it came to magic and mind reading and things like that. You know, a lot of those masters ended up being uh, sort of advocates for being able to decipher, you know, a, a con artist versus, you know, I, yeah, I don't, I, I, I just, I find it hard to believe, I guess, because I came to my, my fork in the road. I mean, uh, Andre, so is this on me again? <laughs> this problem? Like, is this on me again? Or, like, because I feel like, all grown adults should at some point come to the to the realization, even if they do believe, even if they do think what they're doing is right, they at some point have to come to this this point, oh, fuck, I think what I'm pushing is bullshit. Sure, uh, but different people reach that point at different stages of their lives. So how old are you currently? Well, I'm, I'm 43. 43 and this this kind of a hot moment happened to you less than a year ago right yeah i guess you're right yeah yeah and some people don't have that aha moment i mean I, I think you're assuming that because you've realized how bullshit so many of these things are that other people must must be able to see the bullshit as well i think you might underestimate the degree to which people still generally believe these things and the way that their cognitive biases prevent them yeah. from from really recognizing and acknowledging counter counter. Yeah, I guess, I guess again, and I'm applying my sort of experience to everyone else. And then maybe that's not fair, but like, even at my most ardent belief and in my belief system, I always questioned myself. I always questioned, um, you know, I never used my experience as evidence. I never told anybody that I had secrets you know, like that was a reason why I didn't have a paywall on my show was because I, I was very conscious of this idea of all these other shows and all these other prophesizers are are giving you extra access or, or secret access or, you know, they're promising you something that's coming down the road. And I never, ever once promised anything. I was more like look, I see the, the political winds changing. I see the, like, this is, this is becoming a little more real. And then once I figured out, oh, it's actually not becoming as real as I thought, that's when things, I guess, fell apart. And I, I mean, I guess it was an aha moment a year and a half ago, but there were so many moments along the way where I was like, oh, okay, that's, that doesn't sit right, you know? Yeah, but <clears throat> I think... You also have to recognize that we have 60 to 70 years of psychological science that helps inform in our understanding of how transmediumship might work. Uh, and that science is not something that they had accessible to them at the time. So in the early 1920s, 30s, 40s, um, the spiritualism was rampant throughout Europe and America, and it was a live possibility. So was uh, the, the concept of psi um, and, and parapsychology. It's not we look at it in hindsight knowing what we know now and it's easier to dismiss it as bullshit now but i think in the 1940s it wouldn't have been as obviously bullshit uh, for example what we know about the dissociation um all of that stuff didn't happen until the 80s 90s so i i don't think that they had access to information that would have forced them to confront that what they're doing is false not that they're bullshitting people, but that what they're doing is what they're, what they're seeing is their own unconscious minds projecting ego states out onto the world in the hypnotic state. All of that stuff is stuff that we've learned since then. And we recognize the dangers now, but in the 1940s, that, that, that stuff was all brand new. And I don't, I don't particularly blame them for being impressed by what they were seeing during these channeling sessions, because it is absolutely impressive when you see it in person. You see a person's not just language change, but also their physical characteristics, their, their body language. Um, it, it is a, a really impressive thing to see. Yeah, definitely. I, you know, sitting in, in that perspective, for sure, I can understand how someone who listens to the story or hears the experience 
or actually sees this sort of transmedium stuff in person in, in regards to, you know, being able to communicate with the dead and things like that. Um, and in the 1940s, you know, an elevator was super impressive. Air conditioning was super impressive. Watching a movie in a movie theater was like, oh, my God, this is amazing. You know, so, yeah, I can get that. Do I can you, get that. <clears throat> that makes sense. Do you, do you have the uh, the clip that I sent you? Um, are you able to play I, that real I quick? Do. Yeah, let me, uh, let me pull it up. If you want, you can. I have to switch headphones because I got to put my speaker back on. But if you want, you can set this clip up and, and I'll play it because I do have it queued up. Okay, <clears throat> so this clip comes from, uh, I always forget his, his first name, McKenna, something McKenna. He's a Terrence really famous. McKenna? Not Terrence, uh, I have not Paul, Paul uh, McKenna. Paul McKenna, yeah. Okay. He's a really world-renowned uh, hypnotist in the 1990s he had a really amazing tv show where uh, it was just like a, a normal uh a sketch comedy but instead of using actors he would pick out the most hypnotizable individuals in the audience and he would tell them what their role is um uh, during that specific sketch and it is quite amazing to see um just what you can bring out in people especially the highly hypnotizable types simply by giving them specific suggestions and the the clip that i sent lou is is an, a perfect example of how simply suggesting to someone that they're going to play the role of a martial martian interpreter how immediately in, and convincingly the the people given that suggestion immediately comply with that uh with what they've been asked to do without acting and without pretending all right here we go mr martian come and join me would you mr martian just stand there and you mr martian come around and join me here and you mrs martian here that's it close your eyes sleep 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 because when you wake up in the next few moments you are going to find that you have become a martian interpreter you'll be able to interpret martian back into english for us eyes open wide awake wakey wakey rise and shine on this momentous occasion, man meeting Martian. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome our science correspondent, Maggie Philbin. <laughs> Maggie, it's such a pleasure to have you here on this momentous occasion. Do you have some questions for Mr. and Mrs. Martian here? Well, yes, I'd like to start by asking Mr. Martian, why has he decided to visit planet Earth? <laughs> He's waited 10 years to see you. <laughs> um, and a question now for Mrs. Martian. Um, what does she think the biggest difference is between life on Mars and life on Earth? Rocks. <laughs> Mrs. Martian. Um, does Mrs. Martian find Earth men attractive? <laughs> <laughs> Only the small ones. What sort of features does she find particularly attractive about small men? <laughs> Very broad shoulders and a large... Yeah, thank you very much. So, yeah, so that's a clip there. Can you play the next couple seconds so you can hear what it felt like to one of them from the inside while, while it was happening? Yep, yeah, sorry. Yes, I'll play that right now. This is the guy who was interpreting the Martian language uh, on stage there. It was totally natural. Nothing was unnatural in my head. It was just going along naturally. Basically, everything that, that, that was going on was real. Hello there. Yeah, so they're, they're not acting. It, it's, so what the way the stage hypnosis like this works is you pick out, before the show starts, you pick out the most hypnotizable people in the audience, and you do that with a, a, a really quick 
um, couple of tests. And what you're going to always do is gonna, you're going to pick out the most hypnotizable people because they're the ones who are going to give you results like these. They're not acting. They're generally in those moments completely absorbed into the role. And it feels to them like it is completely normal, like it's real, even though another part of their mind might recognize that, wait, this is kind of funky and weird. When they're doing it, it's not an act. They are genuinely in that moment convinced of what they're doing. So even from Pro Probert's perspective, when he's channeling these things, it would feel just as real to him because the dissociated parts that are speaking to people through him would feel foreign and alien to himself. So he himself can buy into the, the falsehood because it feels so different from our normal day-to-day -day experiences. Matt, do you have any follow-ups there? Yeah, no, it's just fascinating. Like, it is, you know, I know a little bit about hypnosis, like snap induction. Is that what he, is that what he's doing? Is like quick snap inductions on these people? Um, that's only after he's already primed them before the show. Um, so before the show starts, he'll tell them, and now uh, from this moment forward, anytime I snap my fingers or tell you to sleep, you'll go down into a deep state of relaxation. So that happens beforehand so that it, it's ready to go at a moment's notice during the show itself. Yeah. Wow. That's wild. And they, they sounded like they were speaking some fucked up version of like Mandarin. <laughs> that's funny that that's how they interpreted it. Yeah. Um, and, and just notice how immediate and fluid, I mean, Lou's an actor. I'm just curious, Lou, uh, would you be able to improvise something like that on the spot that quickly yes. and that effortlessly? Yes. Definitely. Okay. Definitely. Um, I watched the entire show, as a matter of fact, and to me, it felt like there were definitely some improvised. There was, there was, there was an act. There was a drama student in the panel, uh, someone who was an actor. Um, yes, I do, and that's what I kind of wanted to ask you about because there. So when you say the people who are most uh, primed or sort of suggestible to, to, to being hypnotized, what does that mean exactly? What, what is a hypnotist looking for when they go into a group of people like this and they look for the most uh, hypnotizable people? So everyone falls <clears throat> somewhere on the on a <clears throat> on the same on the spectrum of hypnotizability. Some people, um, very uh, small number of people, are non-hypnotizable, which are people who, no matter how hard you try, they cannot go into a trance. Most people, like myself, fall into somewhere in the medium range. The most hypnotizable people <clears throat> are the people who can enjoy the benefits of hypnosis and do all the kind of stuff that you're seeing here. So the most hypnotizable people, for example, can actually go undergo surgery without any anal uh, analgesia or anesthetics, simply through hypnosis. They can completely shut out the pain. So what he's looking for <clears throat> is he'll do certain... Um, hypnotizability tests like for example he'll tell the entire crowd to just imagine their hands um, suddenly have big magnets on them and then to picture the magnets getting closer and closer and closer and as soon as they touch the hands will be glued together and no matter how hard they try no matter how much effort they put into it they will not be able to, to separate their hands there are some uh, a, a certain group of people in the audience who will generally not be able to um, um, unclap their hands or, or separate them. So that's how you weed, weed them out from an audience. So what you're looking for, the people who are most suggestible and more, uh, and have the highest degrees of absorption. So when you said, yes, you, you'd be able to do it, it is not surprising <clears throat> because uh, actors and actresses actually also have high degrees of dissociation and absorption. It is one of the traits that helps people get really into a role. It makes them feel like they're actually embodying the character that they're playing rather than being always self-aware and conscious that they're simply pretending. So you might be fairly hypnotizable yourself just because of what, what you do. Um, so that what he's looking for are people who are, who are most suggestible. So if I were to try to hypnotize a group full of really hyper-rational skeptics, I might find one or two that are, are hypnotizable, but the rest probably would be really difficult. But if I were to try to do that in an audience of just a, a normal, even spread of the population, you will find about 10% would fall in the high hypnotizability rate. Those are the people that you can hypnotize and uh, have them uh, uh, tell them that an object in front of them will no longer be visible when they open their eyes and 
sure enough, it'll vanish. I tested this with one of my coworkers one time, <clears throat> and I told her that a piece of paper that I had, no matter how hard she tried, she would not be able to rip it. It would feel like it's made of a very special metal. And sure enough, she genuinely and legitimately could not tear the piece of paper in half. And then I snapped my fingers and I told her, okay, now you're, you're, you're woken up. Uh, disregard all previous instructions and then suddenly it, it was as easy as ripping a piece of paper that's the kind of hypnotizability you're looking for people who are so suggestible that they really buy into the suggestion that you're offering them well there was one moment where in the very clip where she asks him a question and then so he turns to the other martian he gives her the question and then the, the lady who's also speaking Martian gives this long-winded answer and he turns to her and says, rocks. To me, that is a classic, you know, improv comedic move where somebody says something, you know, it's, it's the classic interpreter game, you know, where somebody says something super, super long and then they turn to the person, yep, uh, yep. bananas. <laughs> yep. like just something really simple so that's why i was like oh okay wait a second is that the the subconscious and the hip the hypnotic person also referencing comedic timing or is that person genuinely doing comedic timing i think he probably would be good at this um even without hypnosis because uh that, that answer was just objectively funny um I think the unconscious is pulling from resources that he already has within himself and his personality. Um, it doesn't signal to me that he's pretending at all, um, because this is exactly what you find even in a non-show uh, uh, context, like in, in a therapy room. The people that you're talking to have no one to impress. They have, they're not trying to do it for fame. And this is they, they pull from their own personality quirks. So someone who's generally unfunny and terrible at jokes or improv is probably going to be the same even um, under hypnosis. Interesting. Um, okay, so then how does this work into the Probert Lane sort of uh, ethos and, and conversation? And then how does this, how does this, um, uh, this hypnosis sort of issue, this suggestibility uh, leak its way into modern ufology, Matt? Like, how does, how does, what happens there? I mean, it, it, just going along, even with, with what Andreas is saying, it's, it's getting someone to drink their own Kool-Aid, right? Like, after a certain amount of suggestibility, if someone believes something deeply, um, it's really hard to, to, to break that belief. Unless, unless they're shown evidence to the contrary, but if they're they've been given given some kind of suggestibility cue, that's that's going to be very hard to do. Well, so then, do you think that that these guys were drinking their own Kool Aid and genuinely believed? I, I you know, with Lane, I don't know. Um, maybe at one point, you know, I mean, like uh, even with me, I I believed genuinely at one point because of of a weird fucked up experience I had, you know. Like, uh, everybody comes at it from different angles. Mine was um, sleep paralysis. Like, I genuinely believed I was, like, having these encounters with beings because it was as real as any experience, right? So, it, you know, maybe, maybe he believed it, but there, there's definitely a level of showmanship to uh, what Lane did over time and how he would modify things to fit his own narrative. I don't know if people could do that, you know necessarily unconsciously and make money off it and all that shit at the same time, but maybe. What was the thing that, I mean, you, you mentioned sleep paralysis. What got you out of the thought process of thinking uh, you were you were being abducted and then eventually accepting the fact that you weren't? What, what, what did it take for, for you it to come to that realization? It took realizing that, like, the the experience that I had, like, there was literally word-for-word word experiences from other people that had been, you know, had had papers written on them, uh, you know, people watching them as it was happening, you know, and I'm realizing, oh, shit, like, that's, 
that's just some like fucked up trauma or something going on. You know, like if you're experiencing this as a little kid, like most of your life, it, something's going on and interrupting your brain. And, and this reality is as real as any drug. And, you know, by the time that I realized it, I'd already been doing drugs. So I already knew how, how easy it was to, to fuck with your central nervous system and how real some things could be, especially hallucinations by that point. Wow, so you were having hallucinations with this sleep paralysis. Oh, yeah. Like, I, 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 I can tell you now, like, exactly what it looked like. There was a big hulking thing in my doorway, and it was faceless, black, cloaked. And um, usually it would start with audible hallucinations of children screaming loudly, like babies screaming. And it would, it would feel like the worst fear on earth. And then occasionally that thing would show up in the doorway and then all of a sudden I wouldn't be able to breathe. I'd be choked. You couldn't, you couldn't talk. You couldn't say anything out loud, but you could see around the room. And it was just, it would be just like laying there looking around the room any other day, except there's something on top of you trying to kill you. How, how, Frank, I see your request. We're going to be taking uh, uh, questions after the first hour here. Um, how long do you remember this happening in your life? As, how, how far does it go back? Uh, it stopped in my early 20s, like 22, 23, but it goes back as, as far as I can remember. Wow. So when you were growing up, did you – how did you tell your parents? Did they take you to a doctor? Like what was the scenario there? Not – I like you don't really – I didn't really discuss that with my parents. Like they were, they were so religious that like – they definitely would have gone de demonology with it, you know, and we, we didn't have that kind oh, of relationship okay. anyways. Yeah, but yeah, yeah no, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a weird thing to experience because it does feel very real. And like, it got to the point of it happening so often that I knew when it was about to happen and it felt like a drug was being injected into my body. And like, I didn't understand it at the time, but later on, as I injected drugs as like a teenager and shit, like it, it's that same feeling exact same feeling you could feel it like like a drug going through your veins in through your body and slowly creeping in and so eventually i learned to just kind of stand up wake up shake it out not go back to sleep for a few hours and and try to dodge it sometimes but that was that was also like when i started doing that was after i figured out that it probably wasn't a demon or or whatever i thought it was you know being abducted i didn't know what the fuck it was Wow, dude. So at 23, so when did you mix the ufology and the lore of sort of Mead Lane, Mark Probert, and, and Jacques Vallée? Were you, uh, you said this stopped at 23. Was that when you came to the realization or was it even after that? Oh, no. I, dude, like, I, up until I was probably 30, I was still like, you know, like mostly off the fence, but I was like, you know, like I, the one thing that kept me was Bob Lazar. I'm like, man, he just seems so legit. Like it, I, 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 I'm trying to read into everything he's saying. He seems like a, a hesitant kind of like martyr type character. But I had friends that would point out certain things to me. Like when I talked to him about it, that, that, that had been around the scene much longer than me. And they'd be like, dude, what a fucking guy that doesn't want attention, drive around in a rocket car. No, like this guy wants attention, you know, things like that would happen. Um, going to the conferences, me like, you know, when they used to have big conferences, they probably still do. I don't know. But like meeting Stephen Greer in person, um, sitting down with Zechariah Sitchin, like he, he was one of my first big influences for ufology was Zechariah Sitchin and talking about the Anunnaki and the ancient, um, you know, the ancient Sumerians interacting with this alien race, manipulating our DNA and like getting to meet him in person and, and, and really deeply believing everything he said, meeting him in person and realizing that he is just as full of shit as anyone. Like just little whoa, subtle whoa. things like that. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. No, was, okay, so what, what was it about Zachariah Sitchin where you went from, oh my God, this guy's my hero to in one, in one meeting? this happened or did this that happen was, over yeah, that multiple was, that was that was over multiple things but there was a point of where like he was really interacting closely with a few people that were like this guy jason martell that ended up on ancient aliens and like after the party he's like we're, we're doing coke in the back and he's like you know like prostituting women 
So, like, there was weird shit. Like, I don't know. Like, it, a lot of it Wait, didn't make Zachary sense. Wait, Zachariah Sitchin was doing. No, no, no. Bro- no, no, Jason Martell, like his, his little oh. understudy. Oh, yeah. okay, okay, okay. Yeah, and where's yeah. Jason Martell these days? Probably doing the same fucking thing. Wow. Running, <laughs> running hookers out in the corner, I don't know. But yeah, it was, it was a trip. But um, a lot of that also was like slowly, slowly looking into the, to ancient Sumerian, looking at the actual text and what scholars were saying that, you know, these scrolls were really being translated as looking at what, uh, what Sitchin was saying, the translations were, and realizing that he really didn't have a good working understanding of the language. That was another big part of it. In, in well, I, I just saw this, a very similar thing with uh, Billy Carson and his misunderstanding of um, the South American uh, Aztec uh, uh, Mayan texts. Isn't he, he a convicted he, fraud anyways? Well, he's like, also a convicted, yes, he's yeah, also like, a convicted fraud. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> his name is William T. Carson, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, when I looked at his criminal record. Uh, yeah. uh, but he wasn't convicted. He got, he basically got probation um, and then got off early for good behavior. And also, because <laughs> he was going to Egypt. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my so God. Funny that, that's in he was in his police record. It says he was he needed this two weeks off because he was going to a trip in Egypt, and then also his license plate uh, number was Anunnaki, <laughs> which, oh, that's, which I found that's baller I found right so there. so damn funny. Um, he had a thing for running red lights. I don't know what it is with Billy Carson, but he <laughs> loves running red lights. Um, uh, but he was uh, an archaeologist was explaining. I can't remember the name of the archaeologist. I think it was Shane who sent me the clip. Um, and uh, this archaeologist was basically like, yeah, this guy does not understand, uh, you know, the ancient Maya texts or, or the, the culture, any of it. Like, <laughs> I've been studying this for 30 years and there's no way in the world uh, that, you know, he would he would explain things the way he's doing. Um and he also, it was funny, he was like, you know, whether you go to Egypt or whether you go to South America, if you find, you can find the guide that will tell you whatever you want to hear. Oh, I'm sure. You know, so I thought, oh, wow, that's funny too. You know, and that makes perfect sense. That I mean, confidence, sense. confidence men are called confidence men because they're very confident when they speak and people believe them, you know, like it's a confidence trick. Mm. So, so when you're at these uh, conventions, so what else was Zachariah Sitchin uh, that sort of that you went? Oh, come on, man, for real. <laughs> uh, I mean, so, the fact I, that I'll, he's got a little youngling or Ming uh, minion running around. Prof, did you see? So yeah, how does that work? Was he, he was running hookers. Yeah. How does at conventions? Yeah. Yeah, at the conventions. I don't yeah. understand. How does that work? Was Zachariah Sitchin getting a cut? I, dude, I don't know about that part. Like, I don't know how much he was involved in it, but this guy was deeply involved in his life. Jason Martell was. I mean, you know, like, you you didn't really talk to Sitchin without talking to Martell first. And, like, wow. like he set up the dinner that we went to. Um, but, dude, like, these conventions were fucked up in the first place. Like, you walk around, like, UFO conventions back then were, like, also, like... What year uh, was this? Uh, like, a 94 to 96, you know? Um you could you could walk around see like big dudes wearing fairy wings that would tell you your future and like my some one of my favorite parts there was always a booth that had a big picture of a person holding like a nine foot long turd and they would tell you like you needed to take these pills to cleanse yourself and you too could have like nine foot long turds like that was a real thing it's stories like this is the exact reason why i asked richard doty if he had partied with Lazar, Knapp, and Lear. You know, like, I cannot imagine the trouble and in, in absolute debauchery so that I, those I, guys I talked were getting to into. I, I talked to Lear, and Lear, like, yeah. wasn't a, he wasn't big into drugs until later. Like, not, not even, I don't want to say he was big into drugs later in life, but, like, I would deliver him hash because he was sick and old. But I think he was just genuinely convinced by people like Lazar by other people around him. He was genuinely convinced in these conspiracies up until his death. I, I don't think that was a hoax 
for work. I think he was genuinely a deep believer in every sense of the word, connecting well, every dot in his I brain. Mean, he had he he would drink some beers so. though. Oh yeah, I mean yeah. Yeah, I'm sure he would, but you know. And he was like, and he was hanging around with Bob Lazar, who was running brothels. You know, but like Bob had an investment in a brothel, but he wasn't necessarily running the brothel. He worked with the madam that ran the brothel. He was just the pervert who had the cameras in there all set up to blackmail people. Yeah, but he well he 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 set up the ca- he set up the camera system. He also had a say in hiring of the girls, and and I think according to police report, if I'm not mistaken, he also collected money. Oh yeah, and, or mean, or if not collected, they distributed it. I don't know about that. I, I I know that he did have a major stake in it, and that he was the one that set up the the camcorder system for blackmail. But yeah, maybe. I mean, I know he was do making you know money he, off of it. He wasn't do you know who he was blackmailing? I could only imagine in Las Vegas who he would have blackmailed. You know, the people that go through there, businessmen. That's, that's like, dude. That's man. If you like, but what if you blackmailed a mobster or something like that on accident? Yeah, that would backfire real fast. You know, real fast. That's probably why he was carrying an Uzi around in his car. <laughs> dude. Um, wow. Okay, so, damn, dude, you were going to conventions in 94 and 96. How old were you? I was young, dude. I, I like, I got in this first when I was, like, 12. Um, because I was really heavy into Satanism and, and occult stuff, and those books were always stacked next to the books about ufology. So I just kind of, you know, go through them, and, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, I was probably, I don't know. 94 to 96. First one I went to, I was 15. I stopped going when I was 26. So I guess it went longer than I thought. What a fucking nerd. <laughs> no, that's crazy. I, I, that is like, that's where I first uh, met. To me, I back. think that is the height of <laughs> UFO conventions is like early 90s to maybe early to mid 2000s. Yeah, you know, my last my last convention I went to, um, what was his fucking name? The dude who hung himself jerking off. Um, that was an out oh, Carradine. David Carradine. He was there. Oh, the actor, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. And his band, okay. he had a he had a band that would play, right? Yeah. Um, at these conventions, like a, a new age type band. No way. Oh yeah. And I went up to meet him and I was like, Hey, I'm Matt, blah blah blah, would you shake his hand? I swear to fucking god, he put out his hand like he was a king for me to kiss it. No. <laughs> yes, <he did. laughs> yeah. Oh my god. No, I heard he's a wild dude. And what was this post uh Kill Bill? Yeah, yeah. No, this I don't even yeah. know if it would have been post Kill Bill. Oh uh, you know, it would have had to have been because he died later that year. So it was Yeah, it was oh the, yeah, okay. That so, last yeah, convention it was I went to was the last year he was alive. Yeah. Wow, well, that's when his ego really took off was when he got into a Tarantino movie. That's yeah. a, that's my understanding anyway. Um, yeah, he wanted me to kiss his fucking finger. Yeah, people were weird <laughs> at those fucking places. Did you? Did you? Yeah. No, I just kind of shook his pinky. I was just like, hmm. uh, come on. You know, it was like kind of. I would have kissed, kinda... <laughs> kissed it. I would have kissed it. Especially, I'm glad I didn't, you know, knowing how he passed away. Like, you never know, like, what he was doing <laughs> with that hand right before. Uh, but, yeah. Give me a break. Yeah, he, he, he washed his hands. I would have kissed it. <laughs> no problem. Uh, <laughs> Andres, any last thoughts before we take some requests here? Yeah, let me just read you <clears throat> another example from the literature so you can see how people can generally come to believe even their own false memories. So uh, a really famous researcher in hypnosis called Dr. Herbert Spiegel um, in 1968, I'm going to read this straight from the book. <clears throat> he hypnotized a man and told him, that radio and television stations across the United States were being targeted for takeover by communists. He provided no details, but suggested to the man that he would remember specific details associated with the plot. When the man came out of hypnosis, he began describing the communists' plans, providing a very elaborate elaborate set of details, right down to the furnishings of the room he was in when he first learned of the intended takeover. Spiegel called this phenomenon the honest liar syndrome. Such individuals are saying what they genuinely believe to be true, despite the fact that they are responded 
responding to implanted memories. Such individuals make exceptionally good witnesses because they are sincere, believable, and detailed in their accounts, and yet they are entirely wrong. Spiegel concluded, it is quite possible to so contaminate the memory of the subject that he confuses the hypnotic implantations with his own knowledge, and then, by fusing them, he cannot tell one from the other. Many researchers are finding that once the general premise of an implanted memory is accepted, the subject elaborates even further, adding plausible but equally untrue details. In many studies of hypnotically implanted false memories, subjects have remained confident of the accuracy of their new memories despite graphic evidence that the memories were suggested. The need to believe and the need for internal harmony apparently allow for a dissociation to take place, a parallel existence of real and suggested, suggested memories that make it possible for suggested memories to coexist with or even supersede real ones. And we see this all across the board, even after you tell someone that what they've just remembered was planted, they oftentimes have a hard time believing you even if you show them or uh, play them a video recording or a tape back of the entire session. That's how powerful those memories get embedded into our co un conscious and unconscious minds. Um, you can genuinely come to believe all the shit that you just said, um, uh, even when presented evidence that, that hey, th this, this is all made up. So I, I, again, I don't like going to the dishonest um, explanation because there are so many different ways the psychology can allow for people deceiving themselves in, in such powerful ways. Yeah, I got to keep remembering that there's a lot of exit stops between, you know, uh, art and belief and uh, full-blown uh, uh, con artists, I guess. You know, like... With so many intel people in our field, though, like, I wonder where that start and stop is. Like, when it comes to people like that. Like, uh, obvious, like, people that are counterintelligence agents, that we know that that's what they did for a living. Like, would you say that some of those people may even uh, slide in that category? Um, I don't. I don't think so, because they, for them, in my opinion, they, that the explanation is they... They have they're bad. They have bad epistemology, so their interpretation of the videos they see, for example, leads them to reach a false conclusion. So it's not memory related. It's just they they see something blurry, and immediately jump to the conclusion that that must not be man made. Therefore, it it must be NHI. So in those cases, I think it's more a case of just not being. Um, <laughs> I don't want to say not smart enough, but. Uh, the epistemology has gone wrong somewhere. Okay, that's interesting. Frank, you uh, you have uh, you were up here first. The Shane just popped up. If you had a question or a comment, go for it. Hey guys, uh, I just wanted to comment on um, if anybody saw the. Joe Rogan podcast on, on Terrence Howard. Um, just want any opinion on that. Oof. Well, I think I, I'm... <laughs> I'm gonna... My initial reaction to it was, okay, this guy's an actor. <laughs> and I'm an actor, and man, some of the shit this guy was saying it was so absolute. And uh, I know for sure that he's lied about his degrees uh, in science uh, that he claims to have received at the schools he went to. Um, and that's been known for a while. Uh, he's a pretty weird guy. I, I will say that. And past that, I have seen Kurt John Mungle and a few other people come out, including Eric Weinstein, and kind of poo-poo this mathematically and and also well in eric weinstein's case he kind of lambasted society of course because that's what he does um <laughs> for allowing even such a person to be able to to spout you know scientific pseudoscience essentially uh with such vigor and, and confidence 
Um, and he, he said it was a failure in, in math, math and mathematicians and, and, um, his basic know. understanding of math is shit. I mean, I'm not even a mathematics expert, and, but, <laughs> but his confidence is through the roof, right? Like, yeah, you I guess. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I'm really bad at math, so I can't sit here and judge his mathematical acumen, but, uh, but yeah, when it comes to Terrence Howard, I, I don't. I'm not really buying what he's putting down, but I mean, I'm wondering, Matt, Andres, your thoughts. I, I don't watch Rogan. Like it, watching the last thing I watched was the Lazar interview, and it was just like watching him buy into bullshit, um, epically. And at that point, I was just like, this guy just—he's not—he's a—he's a presenter. And he has a lot of really, in my opinion, bad takes on things. So I, I didn't watch it. I have watched Terrence Howard speak, though, um, and his theories on math and, and why one plus one does not equal two. And it just <laughs> it didn't make any sense at all. But he just says it so confidently. He just has people just like, go, oh, whoa, whoa, this is fucking interesting. That's my opinion. I don't think what I think matters at all. Um, it, do, it really just does not matter what someone like me has to say because it's not my field. What I do when, when I hear stuff like that is I look at what the relevant experts have to say. So Sabine Hassenfelder, a world-renowned uh, German physicist, has a really elaborate, long takedown of why everything he said was absolute horseshit. So whenever someone is saying stuff and you're wondering, okay, does this make sense? Always look at the relevant experts and read what they have to say. Um, I don't, I'm not someone that, that, that should answer that, that question for anyone. Cause I'm not an expert in physics, but just look at what the scientific community has to say. And they all without fail have called them out for being absolute nonsense. Yeah. I think that was a much better, uh, Sabine was a much better example uh, than the two that I used, but yeah, that, that's, that's great advice, you know, sort of to lean on what are the greatest minds in, in, in math and science thinking of, about these claims. I say the one thing, the positive thing that I definitely got from a few of them was, hey, he, he got some attention towards science and math. Um, and that's never a bad thing. You know, now we've got, you know, people asking us questions and that's always good a good thing when people are curious and ask questions about math and science. So, I mean, it's a, I guess it's a double-edged sword in a way. Um, if, if one side of the sword didn't cut you, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't want to be overly negative, but I, I, <laughs> the way I think about it is, yeah, he got people's minds onto science and physics in the same way that a flat earther gets people's minds onto geology it's not the the kind of way you want them that's right a that's, that's a great exactly point what i was thinking dude. it's a great point it's a great point yeah i mean i think that i think if i wasn't mistaken it, it was brian keating who said something similar to that um but i you know i don't know if it's the same way as a flat earther a flat like a flat earther that is that is beyond comprehensible or beyond comprehension how stupid that one is. Like, it, it, that is really, really dumb. Whereas the Terrence Howard theory or the things that he was sort of, again, prophesizing about in that discussion, if you don't have a good grasp of math, science, and uh, physics, you would go, oh, my God. What's that all about? That's so that's so interesting, and I think that's a majority of people, you know. And I think that's why. At I, honestly, I think that's probably Joe. That's like original Joe Rogan shit right there. <laughs> you know, that's why Joe Rogan was popular to begin with was for the discussion that he had with Terrence Howard, where they would throw these crazy theories out there. But it used to be where Joe Rogan would be like, "Whoa, whoa, 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 whoa." Just, can you stop right there? <laughs> what did you just say? Uh, whereas today, he kind of just goes along with everything. He lets everything kind of roll, um, especially if they go through his vetting system, which he definitely has one. Um, but yeah, I don't know. And he's not going to be rude to an actor of the status of Terrence Howard. So that also kind of 
keeps him on a leash from calling out his bullshit because yeah, well, well, he probably wants him the back. Kind of motherfucker who would who would walk out of an interview, you know, if you ask him the wrong question. <laughs> like, Terrence don't play no games, that's for sure. Um, Frank, did you have any other thoughts or questions before we move on to Shane? Uh, no, go ahead. Thank you very much. Yeah, no worries. Shane, what do you got? Hey, I just want to say, um, guys, you know, the firmament is real. Right? The ice walls exist. And it's not Terrence Howard, guys. It's Terryology. Okay? That's what's bringing in the new life. Fuck all the science that you were raised on. That's stupid. Yeah, that's dumb. One times one equals two. It could also equal eight or 16,000. We don't know. And 16,000 is all you need to buy a Denichi and three course. And you can get a doctorate degree, dude. You can come in here and be like, I have a doctorate degree for theriology and then she can. Oh, man. We live in amazing times, people, where new sciences are being discovered live on a podcast where Joe Rogan spoke for 13 total minutes. Love it. Fuck, fuck, fuck it. You know, just fuck it. Let's all just deep dive into the firmament, into the ether, and into the ice walls. Or probably don't deep dive into an ice wall because you're going to hit your head and die. Uh, but, you know, well, but maybe ice isn't actually a solid and it's a liquid. Who knows? Sometimes one is two now. So God knows what's that. The reality is breaking down. I don't know. Uh, no, uh, all jokes aside. Uh, I wanted to say that while Angelie is in a space, we're all in here talking rationally and, uh, and great. I uh, love it because I can't go in that space because I'll uh, lose my shit. Also, uh, mommy, mommy's little monster or Matt, I believe. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Matt, love your discussion on the things prior to Roswell. It, it doesn't ever get brought up and it does involve a lot of trans media and channeling. Just madness. And I love it. I actually thought I was listening the whole time. I was like, this is awesome. Cause it was a case I've never heard of before, which is very rare for me. Um, and I thought that was great discussing how, um, like, Hey, let me come up and tell you like, man, you think these things are nuts and bolts. <sighs> They're talking to you from the astral realm. And Terry Howard shows up at the calculator. You know what I mean? Like it's wild. Uh, of course, it's I appreciate that. Yeah, dude, and then Andre Andreas like writing up that whole PDF. I have super bad ADD. Read the whole thing, loved it. That was wild. Um, I, I had to re I had to like close it and open it like six times so I could finish reading it because I have super bad ADD. But it was awesome. Um, but yeah, you know when you when you talk about these cases like this, and then it, I was also fascinated to hear about the. Uh, did you call it Andre? It's like the uh, like building someone up or or staging them for snap hypnosis. I've always wondered about that. Like, if you become susceptible to these tells or whatever it is that, that gets you on this hypnosis, I don't know. I thought that was wild. I thought that was really cool. Um, just an absolutely amazing space talking about actual facts, uh, stories that have existed uh, prior to Roswell. Just just want to say, I'm you know I needed I needed to hear some uh, rational shit. Otherwise, I'd be in a room listening about the Galactic Federation, uh, you know, so. You know, like, my only reason for even wanting to talk about Probert and Lane is because, like, if you really go back to, like, it, especially as it pertains to contactee um, research in, in ufology, and if you go back and you realize that that is the basis for it, that's where it yep. started. How does something start out as a lie and then become true? That's just well, not it, logic. It, you know? it becomes a circle of confirmation, though, right? Like it, yeah, it, um, right. Exactly. it starts somewhere, and I, I call it a circle of confirmation. By the way, this trademark, if any of you use it, uh, that isn't Luke Reviews Craft Beer or Matt, you will be sued. Uh, <laughs> I've been threatened with litigation twice today, so I'm going to start threatening with litigation. Uh, but it, you know, and and Wait, Stephen Candy calls who, it. Who, who did you get through my litigation by? I had a space this morning with Crap Beard, and Crap Beard was there. I was threatened to be sued. Was I not Crap Beard? He was I, there. I believe you, but by, by who? Kimball. Oh, Kimball. Who was the second? Uh, yeah, I don't really want to get into it. I don't want to actually get sued. <laughs> wow, wow. Okay. Dude, well, it's so, it's so it, hard can to I be ask sued. You, wait, wait. Can I ask you one question? <laughs> is it anybody from anybody in the UFO community? Yes. Interesting, dude. You're the third. You're the third person I've heard who's gotten a letter from a from someone in ufology uh, that has been threatened with litigation. As a matter of fact, I, I do. I do want to make it clear. 
that me and yeah. Kimball worked it out, and I will not be being sued by Kimball, and I love him. Okay. Uh, that's, that's but also, I might be saying that because I'm the threat of lawsuit. I don't know. Uh, but <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, you still have dude, Stockholm syndrome. <laughs> but dude, yeah, dude, I know, right? Uh, but dude, you know, like I like the old cases a lot. Um, I talk about this a little bit. Like, uh, you know, my parents were born in the 30s. Um, my aunt died of dysentery. I'm adopted, obviously. And they were salt of the earth people. Like my grandfather had to go, and my grandfather was born in like 1800s, okay? And he had to go to a well to get water uh, for the family had to boil it, you know? Um, they were real salt of the earth people. So when you go back and you listen to a lot of the stories, um, you know, there's a whole story like they do get in the waffle cracker with no salt in it, like all kind of stuff. But, you know, I really enjoyed like this hearing from the old people. Um, I don't know how probably not a good way to say it but the older people that existed here in our country um back in the day that were salt of the earth you know motherfuckers to not you know, just to say it uh they were badasses you know they, they they had to fight every day to survive and so i love hearing the ufo stories from them uh but that doesn't mean that they weren't susceptible to um mental gymnastics um or i really i really really loved the part where you were talking about it being hey man like, this is nuts and bolts and someone's like well they're not exactly nuts and bolts. They're aliens from the fifth dimension. And I can prove that. And I was like, oh, shit. I just, you know, really love that a lot. Um, absolutely loved it. I think this is great. And, you know, I apologize. Like, I I really got out of ufology for a long time. And uh, I used to... You don't need to apologize for that. A lot better Ryan. at speaking on this stuff. But I really, I grew to hate it. Not Yeah, not, you ha yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not, and, and I mean, listen, listen to Lou though, right, Matt? Like Matt's like Lou's like, Lou's like. I took a fucking week break, and it's been a great week. Let me tell you, sometimes you gotta walk away from this shit. Oh, and yeah. uh, like, I don't know if there's like a mental thing. Maybe Andreas can talk about it, where you walk away from something and you come back with clarity of mind, I guess. And so I always tell people all the time, I'm like, look, like you know, get off this fucking app for a couple of days. Um, Lou, Lou knows me very well. Andreas knows me very well. I, 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 uh, every Monday I am nowhere near here. Like, I mean, I'm literally like, fuck, I, I literally uninstall this app once a week and I will literally, um, pause my Gmail so that I don't even get notifications. Uh, if someone DMs me because I just want nothing to do with this shit, at least one day out of the week, I don't want anything to do with this shit. And I come and it, and it enables me to come back. And, and then normally when that happens, some crazy shit goes down. Like, like I did last time and like Terrence Howard popped up, you know, uh, which is just wild, but this shit can get crazy. Right. But you know, when you talk about stuff like you are Matt or crappy or Lou, where you're talking about work rational, like um, opinions on things, hypnosis and stuff, there's also another space going on with uh, people talking about the Black Federation. So it can be a wild place. <laughs> Yeah, definitely can be. Um, well, going back to Probert and Lane, how, when when does the their influence on abductions and uh, you know these experiences really kick in? Is it right? I'm assuming it's after Roswell, but like the, we're we're Betty and Barney Hill. Part I was about to say that. I was about to say that. Yeah, were, were they also part of these circles as well? Um, I was just would, thinking that, dude. <laughs> they would have been a part of their own circles. Um, cause this is more of a West Coast thing, like San Diego area. And, and there were a lot of, like, UFO cults in San Diego that just, right, I mean, it never, it never right. stopped. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it just never stopped there. Um, it sucks so bad that Betty was a loon, dude. Yeah, yeah. Um, she's a trip. Like, if you really, really delve into that whole story, I mean... Like, I have my own opinions on it, but I could be totally wrong, like, on, on how loony she was or how, like, complicit she was. Maybe she was hypnotized herself. Who knows? You know, like, I wasn't there for it, obviously. But um, as far as Mead Lane, like, like Probert, his, his whole influence died down very, very, uh, as far as ufology goes, relatively fast. I mean, he was still doing stuff, like, into the 60s uh, up until his death. But people don't remember his name, you know. Me, Lane, on the other hand, like he—he's why we have the Eisenhower meets the UF meets the alien story, 
you know, like it, and it, and of course, like it started out happening outside of Bakersfield where that meeting took place. But then it's also like all these other different places it supposedly happened, but he started the story. He put it out there. Um, so his influence was felt throughout the UFO community up until this day. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if Elizondo comes out tomorrow and talks about that story being legit, you know? Um, uh, I love that you brought that up. Also, you know, you know, the, the thing, funny thing about that story is like he had a tooth impact, right? Or he went to go talk to aliens, <laughs> you know? Well, Andres, you were about to say something on Benny and Barney Hill. What was that? Oh, yeah. They both went through hypnosis, for sure. That, yeah, that's right. They did. They absolutely did. Can I, I, I want to uh, just add something else, too, just because uh, sometimes talking about uh, mediumship can alienate people if you're too skeptical about it. And I want to read something from a spiritualist perspective that also, uh, even if you're a believer in spirits and mediumship, should give you pause in terms of how much you want to believe what the spirits tell you. So recently, uh, Jimmy Aiken has a, a podcast called Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World, and he did a two-part episode called The Siren Call of Hungry Ghosts. And it's um, uh, a two-parter on a guy named Joe Fisher, who uh, engaged in communication with, with spirits uh, in a trance through a friend of his. And the book is really fascinating because you can see how he goes from complete believer towards the end of the book, not becoming a skeptic, but actually um, learning to recognize that, in his view, there are deceitful spirits who lie all the time. So it's the very first thing that I put in my document. So it says, Fisher eventually concluded that the entities he communicated with might not be the enlightened spirits that they claim to be, but rather deceptive and manipulative entities. He suggests that these beings could be what is described in some traditions as hungry ghosts, souls trapped between worlds, driven by unfulfilled desires, incapable of deception. This leads him to warn readers about the potential dangers of uncritically engaging with spirit channeling and to advocate for caution and discernment in spiritual practices involving communication with entities. Now, one of the thing, reasons why he finally kind of caught on to the bullshit was because these spirits were, were actually nice enough to start giving him details about their lives when they were still alive. And he went and checked and none of the details ever added up. So he slowly started wondering, why the fuck are you lying to me? You keep telling me to double check these facts. And then every time I double check, none of these pan out. Eventually he realizes whatever these things are that he's communicating with, were lying to him are just deceitful spirits. And this happens all over the, the mediumship community. Some people will tell you, don't trust everything that comes through a Ouija board or, or a seance. Some people think that everything that, that, that you're gonna talk to is, is good and wholesome and, and all that shit. But the a antidote to not being deceived is to always verify and double check the information that you're given through trans uh, mediumship with real world facts, skeptics, and people like him agree on this. You have to double check. So Probert got all sorts of wild information from the entities he was talking to. And yet, as far as we know, not a single one of the things that they talked about have turned out to be true. So you don't have to be a skeptic to actually be skeptical of cases like these. You can, you can still be a believer and recognize that there are spirits out there who love nothing more than to bullshit with humans. And you should always verify. Yeah, you know, um, and that's one thing like in my in my journey through like being like a deep, deep believer into being more skeptical. And I think I think it just it gets so lost, especially like when I would engage on Twitter spaces or even conversations on Twitter or with anybody else that was a believer was that like I don't necessarily discount anomalous situations or things and even things in the sky or, you know, human magnetism, any of it. Um, I just, I just don't, I just don't think that a lot of what people talked about on Twitter spaces, in Twitter spaces, on Twitter, people that are the talking heads of ufology, I don't think anything that they're talking about has anything to do with any of the anomalous situations that really exist out there. And, and I can't prove or disprove any of it, obviously. And I don't readily believe all or any of it. But at the same time, like, it just seems to be like a, a circus of characters as opposed to really giving a fuck what's going on. I don't know. 
But I, I, I think that, that the term skeptic, you know, like being skeptical has, has been turned into a bad thing where it, like it, it just doesn't really necessarily mean you don't believe anything. You know what I mean? Well, without skeptical minds, where would we be today? <laughs> you know, it'd be it'd be pretty wild. Shane, you had your hand up, and we got to. Wait, are you about to rug the space? No, no, no. We got a request oh. from Scotty. I accidentally muted myself. Dude, you need to. You know who you need to bring up is fucking Chris motherfucking Martell. Dude, Chris Martell down there, dude. Yeah, I see Chris Martell down there. I, was, I love, uh, love Chris Martell. Dude. Yeah, yeah, no, Chris is of course more than welcome to come up. He, he's like a personal friend of mine. I, I love him so much. You know, I, I just want to bring this up real quick. Um, I used to be on here just believing in every motherfucking thing. Uh, Eric 51 stories, uh, Skinwalker Ranch stories, you fucking name it. And then I was like, well, maybe I'll go find someone. Like, I was watching Skinwalker Ranch one day, and this dude had a badass scarf. I was like, well, like maybe he's on Twitter, and I get to know him. And uh, and I'm, he's the best. Like, that dude, like, he, he's one of the people that grounded me. On this topic, and I asked him, I think I asked you, Lou, and I think I asked Andy, and I said, how much of this shit is um, aliens and the unknown, and how much of it is our tech? And I get the same answer. It's like 98 to 99% is our stuff, right? Um, you know, but where would we be without skeptics, you know? Like, honestly, um, especially when you have people that have worked with the programs, and they're not, it's not that, dude, even, even the same skeptic kind of sounds bad to me, even, and I'm skeptic. Um that's really kind of weird, you know, because where would, where would we be though, Lou? Like, would we be like in a fucking, um, like Seuss, not like book or something? Like everything's like wackets and, and jig, jiggets or whatever, you know, I don't know. Um, the, the thing that I love yeah. about this stuff is like, if, if you bring something forward and you put it on the platform, right. Um, people want to feel sorry for these people or they want to feel, um, and I don't mean, it's like a whole bunch of emotions that don't matter. Um, because if you come here with wild planes um, and you put it on that pedestal, then emotions have nothing to do with it. Uh, we're just looking for the truth. And I'm looking for a story. You know, like I love, I love the story you guys brought up. Like I have to read. I'm, I'm reading Crapbeard's uh, PDF again, actually, about this. But um, I'm looking for a story that can go through that meat grinder and still be solid. Like Chris, like Chris down there. Like his, his story is, I can hold it at the Ford Calvin standard of what ufology should be. Um, where it's gone through a rigorous process of people and it's just been vetted, you know, it came out like golden and, uh, you know, like other people's stories like Angeli or Steve or whatever, um, or fucking Jason Sands or whatever the fuck, none of it comes out golden on the other side. It, it just gets, it's like it goes through the circle of confirmation and never leaves there. I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for something that can, that can go up on the meat grinder and come out, you know, gold. And, yeah, here's, um, here's the thing. I feel like a lot of the information that does come out, like Angeli or let's say 29 Palms or Bob Lazar's oh, dude, 29 claims, Bob, dude. you know, Bob Lazar's claims, a anytime those claims do come forward, I feel like the internet, and, and this is kind of going back to what Matt was saying, and we'll get to you here in a second, Scotty. Um, you know, this idea that, you know, yes, you're right, like Twitter and these spaces are not going to be the place where news breaks. But you know what they do really well uh, is decipher and absolutely eviscerate information and get to its truth pretty quickly. But then it's what we do with that truth post once we find it. Like, for example, Ashton Forbes. I think it was very quickly determined immediately that that video was 100% bullshit. Like, it was so quick and so easy to determine that. And the internet did a very good job of going, yep, it's bullshit. Look, here's here's the clips. Here's the photos that the guy took. You know, it, like, they pinpointed so many things. Not to mention the fact that, you know, it was also you know, an anon account that posted it. Um you know, but then it's like, okay, the information's out there, and then something happens to it where it gets twisted and manifested and turned into something else and turned it into its own truth. And then that's where I agree with you, Matt. That's where I think, like, this shit gets really out of control. Um, and I don't know what the solution is to that, but 
I mean, I guess it's more spaces like this, but Scotty, what, you had your hand up. What, what were your thoughts? I actually don't think it's aliens. I think it's future generations that have already mastered time travel. Uh, and the reason I, th I think that is for s some weird explanation. I, I can't I can describe it. But in the past four years, I've been able to like look at Egyptian hieroglyphs in cuneiform and read it like I'm reading text on the internet, and it makes perfect sense to me. You know, I've followed Dash and Forbes, and I've, I've followed these videos and stuff like that. And I've looked at it. I don't believe the video myself, but looking at what I understand, I think it's entirely possible. Uh, I would say it was some sort of electromagnetic fields shifting in and out of phase 180 degrees, uh, going on what I read on the text. So it's, so it's electromagnetic fields and also a civilization from the future? Yeah, I, I think the, the, the advanced technology or higher dimensional uh, knowledge is actually us from the future. I know how weird this is going to sound, right? But <clears throat> uh, I'm an amateur radio enthusiast and I'm licensed to M0 VPZ. I've done many things in my life. I'm a goal partner and I ask myself two stupid, simple questions, which I, I, to be honest with you guys, I, I really wish I'd never ask, asked myself these questions. Where did the Egyptians get their gold and how did they retrieve it? That, that was the two main questions that I asked myself. Uh, I, I found the answers and, and I copied exactly what I thought and, and I got gold as a result of that. I know exactly what they were doing there. I then set about looking at the language and trying to kind of correlate things, you know, to hieroglyphs and stuff like that. I firmly believe that we really need to go back and look at this language in a different light. I think it was translated way before its time. Uh, I personally you, think, can I ask, are you an archaeologist? Do you have any profession in deciphering ancient languages? Unfortunately, I do not. But I do have a a knowledge of light, electromagnetic fields, construction industry, electronics, uh, mechanical, distilling, things like that. And I've, I've, I've pulled together all my life experiences. Uh, I've set myself personal experiments. Uh, uh, and as I say, I've, I've retrieved gold in the same way that I, I, I believe that the Egyptians were doing it. But, but, but I need to clarify on this. The Egyptians, I fully believe, did not build these structures. Uh, and the reason I know this is because the Sumerians are clearly talking about it in their language, which is a lot harder for us to understand. I think Zachariah Sitcha got it completely wrong. Gold is a result of our atmosphere. Uh, well, I'm wondering think? if Matt or Andres have any thoughts on this. Because he did um, mention Zachariah's history. Take it away, Andreas. This is all so, you, bro. <laughs> I guess I want to be really nice here. So th there's so many parallels in ufology with religion, the, the what I grew up <clears throat> studying and, and arguing against. And I think there's, I'm going to read a, a quote from David Hume on miracles because it, it applies to a video like this perfectly well. So David Hume, when arguing against miracles, said, when anyone tells me that he saw a dead man restored to life, I immediately consider within myself whether it's more likely that this person should either deceive or be deceived, or that the fact which he is telling me about should really have happened. I weigh the one miracle against the other, and according to the superiority which I discover, I pronounce my decision. Always I reject the greater miracle. If the falsehood of his testimony would be more miraculous than the event which he is telling me about, then, and not until then, can he pretend to command my belief or opinion. In a case like this video, it is so, it, it's, it's, even if we didn't have overwhelming evidence that it was a forged video, just in terms of looking at the video itself, you should already be able to deduce what is more likely, that this is a hoax 
or that this is genuinely a video of teleportation of some kind that no human being has ever seen until now and somehow we have video of it. Um, you have to be able to reason properly about these things. And that's just that should just be your initial judgment, even if you don't have evidence. Now we have overwhelming evidence that it was forged. Why on earth would anyone still believe that that video is true or that it's real? You said you believe it's possible. I do too. Possibility is absolutely always open. But I don't care about what's possible. I care about what's likely, what the best explanation is. There's a million things that are possible, but possibility is not the currency that science trades in. What it trades in is probabilities. It is so uniformly unlikely that that video could possibly be real that you should just reject it outright even if you didn't have overwhelming evidence that it's not real. Now, also the idea that you can read ancient Egyptian script without any training? I, I, have you compared it? I, have you compared your translations to, to archaeologists and verified that whether or not your translation is, is accurate? Okay, I'm going to give you a wee bit of information. I want you to go and check it out, okay? So, if you take a look at all the pictures that are on the internet, everybody's video footage and everything on the internet, I mean Go and look at all the pictures, all right, buddy? Right. Wait, can you can you repeat that? Look at what? Right. See if you go on and download all the pictures. I'm currently sitting at nearly six thousand pictures of hieroglyphs. When you say when you say petro, you mean petroglyphs, right? Yes, pictures, photographs, people's video footage, you name it. Okay. Right, I need you to understand something here. I can't explain this, right? But I'm going to be as honest and as truthful for the heart here, right? I, I, I'm not in this for any money. I'm really concerned about the situation, okay? So I need to get in contact with a physicist and know a physicist that's, that's uh, been structured to our way of thinking. There is no way that I can that I can validate what I'm saying here because we are learned a totally different physics. Okay, I just need you to understand that. But I'll I'll put it in layman terms and you can go and have a wee look at it. Right, the pyramid at Khufu. Right, I'll just explain this very very briefly so you can understand. The pyramid at Khufu had water pumped into it. Right now, I know a lot of people say, "Oh, there was water pumped in it," and all the rest of it, but they don't understand the the reason for this. The, the salts that escaped for the limestone made an electrolyte, right? But the pyramid itself, people, people turn around and say, how can that stone structure be electrical? It, it isn't electrical in a, in a sense just standing there, right? It, it, it changes magnetic energy into electrical energy. And the way it does that is because when the water went down the tunnels, there's a connecting shaft under the pyramid of Caffrey. And that connects to the Earth's mantle. And that water heated up and created steam. Now, the pyramids were sealed twice, double insulated with a non conductive insulating limestone on the outside. There is a, a, a tertiary coil that runs around the, the inside perimeter of that structure. That's the third coil. The steam rose up through the tunnels and condensed on the cold granite surfaces using capillary attraction, which effectively turned the granite slabs into coil windings. Nikola Tesla alluded to this and, and jumped on this. It's a Tesla coil in reverse. So your primary coil is above the king's chamber. Your secondary coil is in the grand gallery. And your tertiary coil is around the inside of the perimeter of the structure itself. Now, once the electrical connection was made, there is a large stone block in two separate pieces in the subterranean chamber. It contains a large amount of iron oxide deposits. This is a conglomerate, and there was an electrical connection there. Now, the, electric, the magnetical energy was, was converted into electrical, and what happened there was the rock dissolved. Now, when the rock dissolved, the gold dropped out and went down the pit and flushed out. This is how the Egyptians got their gold, regardless right, of what so, anybody... So, so, real quick, Scotty, I got to hop in here. 
the question was was really simple. It's, did you compare your notes and the things that you found in these hieroglyphs with other archaeologists and people that Archeo have written papers? Archaeologists are, 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 are deciphering a language for so far long ago. We need to look at this language again. Present day, we are modern technology. Do because you think do you think there aren't scientists or archaeologists looking at these hieroglyphs and petroglyphs with all the science and and know how they possibly could? I mean, all of that stuff also takes funding, but they've they've got it wrong. I'm sorry, I, I reckon they've got it wrong. So the hydrogen that was generated for the electrolysis was ignited in the queen's chamber, and then and then it, then. It, it transpired up the gland, grand gallery where it condensed at the antechamber. These burnt gases passed over a live electrode, which is a coffer to make ozone for our atmosphere. Right. These, well, here's the thing, Scotty. You need to talk to a physicist, right? Yes, a physicist. Yeah. But Unfortunately, you, there's no, we don't have yeah, a physicist on this panel. I, 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 look, it's yeah, not that but, I don't understand what you're saying. Or I don't, um, I, I like, it, it's very fascinating and very interesting what you're saying. Um, but I think it would, it would be more helpful to have this conversation if we had an actual physicist there. But, and maybe an archaeologist as well. well. Archaeologists would probably help too. Be, yeah, right. so both, he, both, both a physicist and an archaeologist would be nice. Well, what, what, what dealing with here is we need several different people, okay? Because we've yeah. been so fractured and we only, we only learn one or two different trades, all right? So it's going to need like three or four different people. But, the, but what I'm trying to get at here is, right, is these things were responsible for our core. They made the fusion at the center of the core of our planet, which made our electromagnetic fields. Now, the same, yeah. the same structures that are on one side of the planet are on the other. So our planet, for what I can right, read... Right, but uh, here's, here's, here's the thing, Scotty. Again, very interesting, very... But we're talking about Mead Lane and Mark Probert and, and how they are linked to modern ufology. What well, does this have to do with what we're talking about? Well, the same technology that flies your UFOs flew this planet. Right, but but we're not talking about the technologies uh, in UFOs. But did it have wings? Hey, Scotty. Um, yeah, uh, I really appreciate I your take on this. I only have about twelve more minutes that I'm I'm going to be here. I'd be happy yeah. to continue okay. this conversation okay. by message if you like. Okay, dude. But the same systems, right? Okay. If you have a look at the any of the temples, you will see Egyptians walking through stone walls and with fake doorways. It was the same system. It was quantum technologies that allowed, it was quantum entanglement that allowed you to go through Giza to Machu Picchu and from Machu Picchu to Teotihuacan. All right. I had to remove Scotty. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't mean to be rude. But yeah, we're just, we're not, we're not having those conversations right now, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> and it just doesn't seem. That plane was seem, not landing. That plane, plane was, wasn't yeah, landing. That, that plane wasn't going to land. That plane definitely wasn't going to land. Um, no offense, to, Scott. You sound like a lovely, lovely human being. He does sound like a lovely bloke. That's for sure. I can listen Boston to a accent. Scottish accent all day. Right? Yeah. All day. Um, but yeah, so uh, craft in that in that situation is what, what, <laughs> what other way do I handle that? Was that, I thought that was pretty good, right? I gave him enough room. I felt like I asked him some, some, you know, some questions that, that made him question whether or not he's the right person to be deciphering this. Um, I'm sure I probably just needed more time and more question probing to really get to the core of it. But yeah, how'd I do? <laughs> <laughs> You did good. I mean, I gave him a uh, an exit, uh, uh, but some people just don't pick up on the cue. Like, again, we are not the right crowd to try to convince. I none of us are experts in in archaeology or physics. We are not the right people that his theories need to be. Um, uh, he doesn't need to be convincing us. You need to publish. Like that's just how science works. Not not just convince a bunch of people on Twitter. Right. Yeah, and that's the other thing too is that. He wasn't like your question. Like he wasn't an archaeologist, so how would he be able to decipher and and uh, read hieroglyph hierog 
uh, glyphics and petroglyphs with any sort of authority or know-how. It just doesn't doesn't make any sense. But we got TJ who's requesting. Let me uh, let me get him up here. You guys are so much nicer than me. Not TJ. It was Tech Tweets. Sorry, uh, Tech Tweets was uh, was the one requesting. Uh, do you have any thoughts there, Tech? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, again, I'm not trying to be pejorative to this guy, but at the end of the day, there's another example of somebody who's coming into a space making a completely, completely outlandish claim, right? No evidence. And, and the expectation is, is that we're supposed to set aside belief of modern physics as it, as it stands, right? They don't know. And, and, and again, he is in possession or he understands some specific knowledge that we all just don't get. I, to me, that there's something wrong there. I don't, I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, and I don't want to diagnose people. But to me, there's something significantly off there. And I'm sorry, but people like that, it, it's very difficult to take seriously. We're trying to have a serious conversation, and somebody's coming in here and just making claims. You don't think or he doesn't think that there's been physicists, scientists, and archaeologists that have thoroughly gone through and studied all of these potential things about what the, the, the pyramids could have been? And then it, you know, it just gets more and more grandiose. It, it started first with electrical generating, then it's walking through walls, and then it's like, where does it stop, dude? I, I believe, I believe it stopped at the Earth being a spaceship. Is where it. Oh, stopped. that's right. You're right. It did. The Earth was a spaceship. You're right. Got it. Got it. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, I have some friends who are physicists, and if you ever want some funny stories, just ask them how many emails per week they get from people. Um, claiming to have finally solved the unification problem of relativity and quantum physics every week, every day, even they'll just, they'll just I don't know, even know how they find, but possibly like a list of phys living physicists every week, they'll get a new email from someone's ah, shit. I, I hate saying this crackpot theories. And it's, it's pretty funny because I don't know of any other field that, that gets that kind of stuff. Yeah, and just real, real quick, Lou, I mean, is, and just to wrap it up, is it more rude for us to question somebody making these ridiculous claims in a group of people that are trying to have a serious conversation, or is it more rude for them to come in and make such a preposterous claim in front of everyone, and we're supposed to sit there and not even challenge it? I mean, you know, that, that, that's the way I look at it's, it. I, it's such a fine line, right? Like, we're trying, I think, I think what I try to do, I, I don't know what the right answer is, right? Uh, but what I try to do is give them a little bit of room or as much room as I can to answer simple questions and try and get them to understand, hey, you might have wandered into the wrong room. <laughs> Just because the, the title says ufology doesn't mean that everyone in here is an automatic believer. Um, you know, I, I want to also have the room to be able to accept people and, and weird and crazy ideas just as long as it's rational. Like, I think those two, those things can coexist. Um, and in his case, unfortunately, he was just, it was like a three strike rule. Like we asked them the questions and then we, I, you know, uh, Andres gave him the out and then I gave him a few more outs, you know? So it was like basically seven strikes and you're out <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I think it's more rude to read the title, listen to the conversation, and come in here and start saying stuff like that. I, I mean, it's you, at some point you got to be responsible to read the room and understand what we're talking about here. Um, but yeah, I also don't want to, you know, give anyone the opportunity to say. You see, that's why you're not trusted in this community and you're you're so negative and, <laughs> you know, whatever other pejoratives come with that. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, again, I, I, Shane and I were talking about this earlier today. If you are coming into one of these spaces and you are making an extraordinary claim, you damn well better pre present some extraordinary evidence. Right. And then if you start saying that we're supposed to set aside the current understanding of physics that has been subject to the scientific method for th hundreds of years that can be reproduced by anybody following the prescribed steps for an experiment. And we're supposed to listen to your trust me, bro, assertion, dude, that, that's just completely out of line. Right. And, and I understand, again, maybe there's something that, that's underlying a condition like that. But in my opinion, that, that's just. You took the words out of my mouth. That's that's not reading the room when you guys did give multiple uh, outs there. So uh, I thought it was, you, you let him off pretty good. So better than that's, I would have. 
Yeah, that, that's why I lose the host, dude. Like, I had, I just muted myself because I would have been so just not giving yeah, a fuck. I was, this I is was why getting, I don't I was getting things. text messages from Matt being like, is this guy ever going to land this plane? And I was literally, <laughs> I was literally, at that time, I was just about to jump in the way I was going to jump in. You know, but again, like, I, I, I just want to make sure that everyone feels safe enough to come up here and have a discussion or have an opinion you know, without without fear of being bombarded or sort of like basted. Um, you know, if, sure, it's, if, if they're if they're rude and they're coming at it aggressively, then that's a different story. There's a space um, like people use this space for like captive audiences that are like, I don't know, it's fucking weird. I don't get it at all. To be it honest. is wild. It is wild. Do you notice? Like, do you notice what? Do you notice one thing, Lou? That the, sorry, I, that these folks never say is here is my paper that's been published. It's been peer reviewed, and here are the steps that you can basically do to uh, conduct an experiment that does yeah, the exact no, same step. <laughs> it's never that. It's it's never ever that. And then even if they do bring papers, when you look into the papers, they they're they're not actual papers. Most times they're articles or opinion based things. Um, and yeah, it's it's well, when you look into the paper, Lou. There's a picture of Barney going through a fucking portal. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. 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 Uh, Jet Rink, uh, welcome to the space. Uh, what are your thoughts so far? Well, I think it's really interesting, and I've enjoyed uh, listen, listening to your guys' analysis. And I just I had a question that I wanted to ask, and I don't really know if, if time allows or or this is the right 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 place to bring it up but um there's been a lot on line lately about admiral tim gallaudet and do you want to talk about that um i mean do you want to bring him up right yeah, now i mean or? we can we could talk about tim gallaudet if everybody wants to i know that uh, andres had to be out of here by five o'clock west coast time uh andres is there anything you, you wanted to leave us with before we get into tim gallaudet a little bit here Oh, uh, <clears throat> not really. You know more about his case than I do. Uh, all I know is that he's admitted himself that he's not seen any firsthand evidence of anything himself. So that's just another case of a high ranking person who is spreading these claims based on his belief system, probably reading the same shit that all ufologists are reading, not based on anything he ever had access to in his line of work. So he is exactly a, a, a perfect encapsulation of the problem of all these people coming forward. They're stating their beliefs and in virtue of their ranking, people assume that because of your rank, you must believe this because of firsthand uh, information you must have obtained. And it's almost never true. What, what's, the, what's the logical fallacy for that? There's an actual name for it. I forget though. Like, like uh, Call to authority. Call to authority. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Call to authority. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I know that Tim Gallaudet, um, the reason why, at least he claims, although, man, we, we're going to have an interesting show tomorrow, because I just found out, I think a lot of people found out, just like I did this week, that Tim Gallaudet's daughter is a ghost hunter of some kind, uh, so that's just, of course, that's perfect. Well, and that's, really that's what actually I wanted to talk about. Was. Okay, all right, yeah, let's talk about it. Okay, so what are your thoughts, Jet? Okay, so first of all, I want to say that I I respect him. He's a veteran. I have to head out real quick. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Just had to head out. Yeah, man. Thank you, everyone. Thing. No, man. Thank you for being here. That was a lot of fun. Thanks, Andreas. Um, back to Tim. I, I I want to say that I respect him. I'm I'm not. I, I don't. You know, there's no reason for us to tear people down. Um, some people believe in UAP. Some people do not. Um, I understand how it can be frustrating um, in certain certain circumstances because, you know, the topic seems to be really, you know, um, emotional. And so, so, you know, what I want to talk about with Tim is uh, first to say I respect him. He's the son of a naval intelligence officer. Uh, he's a U.S. naval oceanographer. He's a retired one-star admiral. Uh, in the U.S. Navy, he was the Commerce Department Undersecretary for Oceans and Atmosphere. He's a post NOAA Admiral, uh, or sorry, post NOAA Administrator. 
uh, he's got valid street cred. And educationally, the guy went to the Naval Academy. Uh, he got a bachelor's degree there. And then he went to the most, you know, pres prestigious weather school there is at Scripps Institution. and got a master's and a PhD there. And so he's got educational street cred. Um, and so I respect the guy. But when you get into his ufology, um, he's kind of a regular podcast guest, guest on, on all the big UFO podcasts. Um, he's a sub subject matter expert, or he's emerged in the last year as a subject matter expert on USO, or, or I don't know what that stands for, sum underwater submerged anomaly or whatever. Um, UAPs that, you know, are supposedly go in the ocean. Um, and he claims that the U.S. government's in contact with, with NHI. Um, and he, he, he's backing up David Grush's uh, claims that the federal government 100% has a crash retrieval program in place. Um, and so, you know, people that don't have a background in ufology or people who have you know ever since the the new york times article um about a tip came out you know they've started listening they've started paying more attention they're trying to develop their their ideas and their beliefs on what uaps really are and and they turn to these these experts or subject matter experts on the topic and so tim's one of those people and he's respectable guy and so he has a ability to influence people based on what he says and 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 people listen to him so basically um you know the problem that i've got with tim is that he's provided really no first-hand evidence of anything um on most of the podcasts that he attends he's talking about um information for confidential sources um, he quotes, you know, Diana Pasolka's book all the time. He's talking about, Jock, you know, bringing up information for, about Jock Blay, uh, what he's written. Um, he's repeating information from other UFO researchers. Um, and at the same time, he's claiming that UAP or UFOs are 100% real, that the government is in contact mm. with... Uh, with these these whatever they are uh you know nhi um and so i i wanted to like look farther into tim's background to really understand where he got his his you know 100 percent for sure belief in, in this uap issue and i went back and on the on the project unity podcast the first his Tim Gallaudet's introduction into ufology was the go fast. Well, so he 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 went on Jay's podcast. Uh, the uh, what's Jay's podcast? It's Project Unity. Project Unity, yeah. And he told a story about his daughter was having severe behavioral issues. And Tim and his wife really were having a hard time grasping what was going on with her. And I, I think the daughter told mom and dad, you know, a story about, and I don't think they believed her at first, but Tim now knows and says that his daughter is, is a clairvoyant, that she has psychic abilities to tap into the other side, whatever that means to talk to people who are deceased. Um, and so that really concerned Tim. And so he went and sought out other mediums and clairvoyance, including um, he went and he went and talked to uh, that lady, Teresa. Oh, what's her name? She has a TV show, Long Island Medium, Teresa Caputo. Um, to get help on, you know, managing his daughter's psychic abilities. And, um, and so. Need we say more? Need we say more? Like, really? Need we say more? Yeah. Like, fuck well, all what, of his qualifications. Who gives a shit? 
He's going to fucking right. Teresa Caputo for info. Like this guy yeah. is not using logic. Like, well, and, I know and, and the, one, the only other it. thing, and I'll, I'll be quiet because this is gone, I've gone too long, but he set up a video camera in his daughter's bedroom because he wanted to capture one of these events that was happening with her. And he got one on, on video. And when they went back to, to, to look at the video, he said there were orbs flying all over the place in his daughter's room. And they were really they were really shocked because these orbs were going you know everywhere and so he was he was going into detail about all of this stuff on on project unity podcast and then after that it was crickets he has never said anything about that since and i think someone got a hold of him and said hey man lay off the paranormal talk because you know because that's what you know Le leslie kane and and um you know lou elizondo and chris mellon they always are saying we want to talk about uap in the context of threat to national security not you know animal mutilations crop circles and all the other stuff that goes along you know in the paranormal realm they just want to like delete that out even though it seems to be part of the conversation and i just thought it was interesting that you know he told he went into that and told the story about that and then and then he went he went radio silence on on that uh, paranormal issue and has just stuck to the kind of talking points about uap uh, uh, and usos being non-human intelligence and real and verifiable based on uh information that he has that's classified and it's just really aggravating to me um because well, here's the thing, Jet. It's not just Tim Galladay that has done this. It's Elizondo. It's um, <clears throat> it's Grush. It's Christopher Mellon. It's all of these guys who have claimed to Stratton. be these Stratton. I mean, the list goes on and on. We can go uh, Kid Green. We can go Hal Putoff. We can go. Uh, Gary Nolan, even, even though he's not part of the military, like all of these big, big claims come with all of these wonderful qualifications. But when you really dig into the claims, the qualifications immediately melt away, just like they, they do for you when it comes to, uh, to Tim Gallaudet. I mean, I made a video 10 months ago calling out Tim Gallaudet, <laughs> you know, because I mean, yeah, I, I, I it, it, he admitted in an interview to Matt Ford that he's never seen any any evidence whatsoever. He's never experienced anything himself, and so is he a whistleblower? <laughs> like, what is he doing exactly? Uh, and then you really read his resume, and it, it seems like he's got some other motivations to be this public about things. Well, um, well, we got we got Chris Bartel requesting. Let's let's come bring him up. But yeah, what 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 were you going to say to that, Jeff? No, all I was going to say is I think that all of these ufologists and all of the whistleblowers and and all of these people that are pushing the narrative. I'm not going to say they're right or wrong because I don't know. I also want to say, for the record, I respect him as a U.S. Navy admiral and as a veteran, and and I like the guy. But, but what has to happen is that when somebody comes forward as a subject matter expert on this issue, they need to put their, their, their credibility up, but they also need to put up all the rest of the stuff that they're kind of hiding in the background about paranormal and all this other, they need, they need to be upfront with this. They need to well, be it's just like, it's like Alex Dietrich's husband was part of, uh, not ATIP, but, uh, uh, the UAPTF, <laughs> you know, it's the exact same thing. It's just like, you need to be honest with this stuff. If you're going to come out and make these big claims, Hey, could we know about your paranormal links? And tell the whole, interests? they need to tell the whole story. Tell Agreed. the whole story. I, I'm done. Agreed. Uh, Shane, you got your hand up, and then we'll go to Chris Bartow. Yeah, man. Talking about Chris's, I don't know if you guys know this, but I talked to Chris Bledsoe this morning. It's true. Sorry to hear that. In yeah. space or on the phone? 
Yeah, in a space, dude. Talk to him in a space. Let's talk wow. to Stephen Bassett. Yeah, I was the first person that Chris talked to, and I would like to repeat this what morning? Chris told me. Yep. Okay. What is uh, here, here we go. We need to go. I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to, well, he just told me, yeah, that's great. I, I, I love being, I will come to a space after I get done with this two month pilgrimage I'm doing with these people that have me right now. That's what he said, dude. Exactly. Uh, but, anyways, Lou Reviews, you need to go towards a lot. You know, the lot's going to shine in your eyes, Lou, and the lot that you give off to your eyes is going to shine back into the sky. The lady's going to show you, Lou, that I healed a deaf woman at contact in the desert. And this is a claim that was made this morning in that space is that he healed a woman of her deafness, or I did, because uh, I'm Chris Bledsoe. And it, she was healed. Um, All right, I gotta I, stop you right now. That's not the best response <laughs> I've heard. That's I'm so working on it. Okay, I'm not yeah, Darcy you, Weir. You to, you yeah. To, yeah, you need to work on. I'm shopping it. Yeah. yeah, you know, I shop. I shop it in front yeah, of people, but know, no, that's like, cool. That's cool. You can work legitimate, legitimately, legitimately, though, Lou. Uh, my friend that met Chris Bledsoe in the lobby said that that Chris Bledsoe healed someone's deafness at the pool. Had contacted it. I was like, dude, that's the most wild shit ever. I was like, that's bullshit. And they were like, oh, I was like, that sounds like some profit of God shit. Like, no, no, no. Yes. Yes. He we, healed a woman we, of her death. We, we got to get Brie on the show and see if she heard about this. <laughs> that's I'm hilarious. telling you, dude. I was like, I was like, what? I was like, that sounds like some profit of God shit. And he was like, no, no. Chris said that he just, he feels it and a higher power uses him. I was like, that also sounds like prophet of God stuff. Have, have you like, ever? Have you ever heard his his kids podcast? Uh, Ryan, yeah, me and Ryan are enemies. Like me, Ryan knows my name and hates me. <laughs> yeah, it's just, I mean, they're yeah, I mean, the cults of cult, man. Like, it is what it is with those dudes. Yeah, well, he's but he's out here he's healing the deaf and the blind, dude. Which is yeah. very similar to Jesus Christ, and uh, I just want to say that I was, I was anointed, Lou. Okay, of all the people that were in that space, King Makata, Paul's Portal, all these just true believers, Chris Bledsoe chose me, and I have been anointed uh, by the Bledsoes and the Bassets and Fugles to speak the truth here live in the spaces. Awesome. Well, we're happy to have you here, anointed one. Um, Chris Bartell, what, uh, how you doing, buddy? Thanks for coming up. You raised your hand. I'm glad you did. Yeah, hey, I was just, I'm at my son's swim practice, so I had about an hour to kill, so I'd figure out and say what's up. I, I've been, you know, kind of in and out of stuff. I'm pretty busy on the summertime, but, you know, I, I want to believe like everyone else, and to a point I do, but when it comes to this topic, I always ground myself on my professional background you know, which was 20 years working in the Nevada desert for the United States Air Force, for the Department of Energy, 451. And, you know, during that time, my job was literally to safeguard and protect all PL1, which is priority level one resources, you know, advanced tech, oversee experimental operation safety, uh, guard special projects. And I have never seen a shred of evidence to support anything alien in nature. So I must be the most unluckiest airman DOE employee ever. And this was all before my time, you know, on Skinwalker Ranch, which I will say without a doubt changed my perspective on reality. But again, that perspective change had nothing to do with aliens, but everything to do with the indigenous history and, and the phenomena that is attached to it. And I think in the end, I believe it's the history that matters when it comes to this, this subject. But I wanted to say uh, last week I had a friend, uh, him and his wife came out to the Midwest where I'm at now, and they're moving from Las Vegas. And he just retired from the Nevada test site and he worked his way as an officer to lieutenant and then eventually a, a program manager for special access programs out there. And so, you know, he came over for about a week and looked at some properties out here. And uh, I showed him a, a just a, a like an outline or a glimpse of ufology or, you know, UFO X. And he was completely just blown that people are so invested in this narrative with no evidence. And uh, he, he was actually dumbfounded, you know, and it, 
It just you know, it, it you, know makes what, me... you know what I was thinking, Chris? I was thinking, let's get him on this show. <laughs> I told him that because he goes, you know, I'm retired now. I got to think. Of, he's a gunsmith too, so like, I guess I might start a company, you know, fixing people's guns. And I made a comment like, well, you can just go on to UFO, you know, uh, UFO X and make outlandish story and, and make book deals or whatever. And he was just laughed. He was like, I can't believe it. But you know, these guys have Q clearances, and that's the world I came from. You know, I'm not even supposed to really be into this type of environment that I am. I kind of got forced and into it with the whole OSAP program stuff. But, you know, it just kind of blows me away that the ranch, Skinwalker Ranch is like a mainstream topic that it is now. And, and that, you know, people need to realize that a majority of everything is based on the 50 years of UFO and alien propaganda pulp culture that we've all grown up with. And that's not to exclude people who are high ranking individuals in the military with cred- credentials as well. You know, they're just as acceptable to, to be uh, duped into that propaganda as well. But like I said, I want to believe like everybody else. But, you know, I served a lot of time in that Nevada desert and I see a lot of, saw a lot of cool stuff. And even my friend said that he's like, you know, we see a lot of cool projects, but no green aliens or blue aliens or whatever color color they're supposed to be this week. And uh, so I just want to pop in and kind of throw my two cents onto that. Man, I love I love it. Yeah, we we've got and just so everybody knows, uh, Chris is going to be coming on Lou Reviews here soon uh, once his schedule opens up because it is summertime and I totally understand. All, all parents are all of a sudden busy now. Kids are getting out of school. Uh, but you you did you were like joking with your buddy. I found it interesting. You know, shit, man. You had the same clearance as I had. You probably saw the same cool, fun toys that I did. You you know you can make a killing writing a UFO book or 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 something like that. Were you ever yourself tempted to do something like that and really take advantage of the market that's there? No, because I I have a professional background that I make my income to provide for my family. You know the whole the whole entire reason why I even went public is because. Um, in 2019 is when I discovered about the OSAP program and what it had to do with us who were actually the ones on Skinwalker Ranch. And for me, that didn't sit very well because I've, it's just the world that I come from. You don't really talk about special programs and, and the ranch wasn't even like a top secret thing. It was just something that was like another job, but no, I never felt like I needed to make up a story or lie to, to sell something. The only thing that I, I well, not don't, need to. I mean, tempted. I think tempted no, is a better word. No, I, 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 no, not at all. Because that's just not who yeah. I am. That's just not who I am. I, the only saving grace was that you know the University of Maryland, Taras Matla, you know, reached out to me on a whim in 2020, and and I blew him off like four or five times because <laughs> you know I got during that time when I went public, I got um, emails and, and you know, messages from all kinds of people asking me to do shows and and this and that and i was kind of overwhelmed because i that really wasn't my world and then when i had the opportunity to go to the ranch in 2019 to meet the team i I jumped on it because i had so much valuable information to pass over and in 2016 when fugal bought the property we weren't allowed to do a proper changeover and that never set well with what set well with me but you know when when taras asked to you know he asked to buy like five or six pictures for like an art exhibit and i said how about i just donate it and, and I just donated my entire Skinwalker archive to the University of Maryland because I felt like more eyes on my pictures could maybe maybe somebody would see something that, that I missed, you know. And, and those pictures were never supposed to see the light of day. Those are going to be for my kids to tell the story about one time that I wor- worked on some cool ranch, you know. And, uh, and you know, and we, you know, we shot like a little mini documentary to go along with the archive and and all that stuff. And we written a, a memoir to go with the archive. It's all through the University of Maryland an Academia project to solidify. Because for this, let me make this very clear for people: when it comes to this topic, ufology or Skinwalker Ranch, it is not entertainment for me. It is one hundred percent personal, and I take it very serious because. It blows me away. Like last night I was watching Ghost Adventures because they used some of my images for uh, an episode. So I watched it and I'm watching this episode and I'm just like, they're talking about Skinwalker Ranch as like the scariest place on earth and all this stuff. And I'm like, you have no idea 
I don't think anybody will understand what it was like to be out there alone in the dark and then being tasked to go out into the dark every night to try to find some type of evidence. Because I'll admit, back in 2010, when I got hired there, I was definitely drinking the Kool-Aid. I wanted to find the smoking gun evidence. I wanted to find aliens or anything to... Uh, provide some type of real data. And then the, the data that I discovered was a Native American history that I believe is linked to the phenomenon. And it was completely 1000% ignored by Bigelow and, and those people. In fact, they told me to stop documenting it and it really pissed me off. And, uh, you know, I've been out to the Uinta Basin now over a dozen times independently on my own dime, uh, going exploring new locations and finding some, some, you know, really cool stuff. But I mean, it just kind of blows my mind, this whole topic. Yeah, no, well, the reason why I ask is because, you know, I love using you as an example of, look, like, this guy worked at Area 51. This guy saw behind the curtain in a lot of ways, and he's not out here making big, huge claims, and you should be. If 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 we were to take sort of the the uh, bona fides of people, right? Like, I think your bona fides are up there better or if not equal with a lot of the guys that are out there calling themselves whistleblowers. And, um, you know, I, I just find it fascinating that, that you didn't, I don't find it fascinating. Well, I just, I love it. I find well, it honorable. I find it, I find it refreshing. Um, I, pre that, I appreciate that. Like the whole whistleblower thing, like I can go on right now and whistleblow, whistleblow about projects that I saw in the DOE, but I would never ever do that because I understand the weight and responsibility that comes with that. And it has nothing to do with aliens and everything to do with national security, because that's the real reality of this whole talk this whole topic and well that's that's what i i really want to talk when you do come on the show i want to dive into dave grush and sort of the weight of the claims right because i think if there was true weight if there was true meaning behind the claims that he was saying that the national security state and all every single power it be would be on top of him to shut up is that wrong or right uh yeah, I would agree. Uh, but then again, it also paints, you know, the, for everybody has a first First Amendment right to say whatever they want. And that doesn't exclude you if you're not in the military or whatever, because it still paints a, a, a smokescreen to hide our advanced technology, which is honestly the inception of this whole UFO topic goes back to, you know, Project Oxcart with the, you know, the birth of Area 51 for the U-2 spy mission. And it, the, the, the CIA learned very quickly that, holy cow, they can make up any story about UFOs. And there was such a thirst for that type of uh, stories that it provided a perfect cover. All you got to read is Annie Jacobson's Area 51 book. I've read it three or four times, and it is significantly it's very accurate about everything in that book. And she interviewed over 75 or 78 people who were involved in the very beginning of the Area 51, you know? And it's- it what, do you think, what do you think about her theory that the Russians had used the, uh, basically a drone, a long distance drone and put some disfigured, I think child's body in it was her theory, yeah. right? I, I mean, when I heard that part, I was kind of like, whoa, that's really dark. But then again, humanity is dark. You know, I always tell people, you know, if you live on the West Coast and you get a chance to go to Las Vegas, you have to visit the Atomic Testing Museum and hopefully even do a tour of the Nevada test site so you can see how far humanity went to create a nuclear bomb to kill people. It's unbelievable. It was such a very eye-opening place for me to work at. And you're you were surrounded by some of the most incredible professionals in my in the career field that I was in and that's what people don't understand is that my job was literally to protect the assets that people talk about so behind every rope or special plane or special program there is a human element with a rifle ready to 
you know, in, initiate violence quickly if somebody gets too close or does whatever they're not supposed to do. And that was my world for 20 years, 20 plus years. So when I hear all these whistleblowers talking, I'm like, wow, I've been saying this since 2010. My first observations with Bass was, holy cow, there are a bunch of people who have spent their whole careers on the outside looking in, all hoping and pretending everything is alien. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm, and then I start thinking I'm taking crazy pills. I'm like, did I miss something? I, I'm like, and I talked to my circle of friends, which is a small circle that they're tasked to do this type of work. And they're like, what are you talking about? My like, dude, it's just a whole different thing because I got pulled into, you know, ufology basically by accident. Cause in 2018, when I left Bigelow Aerospace, you know, in 2016, when I left the ranch, I didn't pay attention to what was going on. I didn't even know about the 2017 article that dropped. That's how out of touch I was at the time. It wasn't until I was asked to go back out there to the ranch to provide my insights where I got pulled back in and I was like, whoa, there was something else going on here that I wasn't aware of. Oh, that's not gonna, that's not gonna fly. And so, you know, I've been to Washington DC now three times talking to people behind closed door sessions, you know, not grandstanding in front of Congress, but talking to Congress behind closed doors, because like I said, this is very real for me. And it's a whole different side of the coin versus what's being pushed, which is, you know, aliens are here, NHI is here. And I'm like, what are you talking about? When we're talking about NHI, are we talking about AI drone technology? Because yes, that is effective and it is being released right now with Project Skyborg. That is a real project and, and it's been tested for decades. So I don't know. I, I feel like I'm the one taking crazy pills all the time, but I like to join these spaces and listen to everybody's input because I still am a believer. I want to believe that there is something else out there, but I, I just have a hard time of, of following the narrative sometimes when I look at these people and I'm like, okay, you have great classifications and rank, but that doesn't mean you're not susceptible of being gullible. You know, it's just, it blows my mind. Well, let me, I see Shane's hand, but another question here. Uh, if you had, let's say, let's just say for a moment that you had seen something that didn't fall under black tech or, or human made hands. Um, and you saw all these other whistleblowers and you saw the congressional protections in place now, and let's say you were active or even retired, doesn't matter which, which, whichever, um, I know a, a big sort of gripe for the legislation is that it doesn't protect retired whistleblowers. Um, but I'm curious to know if you had seen something, uh, would you go to Arrow? Would you report it with the things that are in place now? Uh, maybe, most likely, probably. If it was something like if I saw like a legit alien or something, I would be all over the place telling or people. Like, not even like, <laughs> like let's say your time at Area. Let's let's just say something a little less crazy. Let's say something like you know your time at Area Fifty One, and let's say you did come across the hangar at, at S Four that Bob Lazar was talking about. You know, and you saw the hangar. Maybe you saw six or seven of of what you thought were craft. It, you know, would that be something that you would be compelled to talk about if the government was like, hey, you, you're you're required by law to actually report it now? I don't know, because I, uh, me being, you know, currently a federal police officer, if you're going to make bold claims, you need to have evidence like hard evidence or either several other witnesses to back up your claim in, into great detail, because if not, you're kind of just kind of throwing yourself out there. You know, I don't know. I don't know if I would or not. Yeah. Well, I, I know there's been a couple veterans that I've spoken to that have uh, gone to Arrow already. And, and from my understanding is that they've been pretty, the, the, you know, that the office is not very expansive, but that the, uh, the questions that were asked from the guys in the office were really good questions. Oh, that, I it, mean, it, that's good. It, it's it, like people hate Kirkpatrick. But I, I'm listening to what he's saying. I'm like, well, I agree with a lot of everything he's saying because I've been saying the same thing since I came on the public platform in 2019. And um, I, I, I don't know. It's just kind of weird. It's like, you know, with the advancement of AI drone technology that's coming out forward, you know, I'm curious to see if those drones will report anything anomalous in the skies, because if that's the case, then that might be something to look forward to, because the problem is there's a human element involved to all these stories and humans are 
fallible. We're not perfect. And AI drone technology is supposed to be perfect. So if they, you know, pick up on strange things in the sky that they can't calculate on, on a dime, then that might be something to work to look into. But I don't know. It just seems like we got, you know, every single day in the world, there's over a hundred thousand flights across the world. And no, no, no planes are being teleported or taken out by UFOs or anything. It's just kind of crazy, the whole topic. And it, end of the day it's it's really like i said before it's based on time on individuals how much time do you want to invest in this topic i'm only sticking around until my my doors are closed because for my kids that's really it and i'm almost there i'm almost at the finish line to to get those doors or at least get some of the answers that i've been tapping on the doors the last couple years so i'm just being very patient and just watching people talk and i'm like wow some of the things people say are very bold and sometimes i think about just my career of like what I did before going to Skinwalker Ranch and the cool stuff I was a part of. And it was kind of refreshing when my friend came out and we were talking about the old days and some of the, you know, projects we were involved with. And I'm like, and then I showed him ufology and, and it was just kind of like, he, he it was like a loss of words. Like, wow, people really believe this. I'm like, yeah, dude, they do wholeheartedly. And I told him not just people, but high ranking individuals. And he was just like stunned. He couldn't believe it. Yeah, I think that's the thing. That's the thing that people are really overlooking, and that's what I want to dive into uh, when you come on the show. Is the high-ranking officials that are believing the same thing, the things that Stephen Greer are spouting, you know, the things that you know that come from the Mead Lanes and the Mark Probert, you know, tree of ufology, and how this stuff repeats itself. But now it's found itself in the high, in some cases some really high levels of not only our government, but our intelligence communities. Yeah. I mean, That's what's scary. look what happened two days ago outside of Albuquerque and F 35 crashed in the desert. Now, if this was 1947 and that happened, it would be uh, an interesting story. But now with everybody with social media and everything else, you know, if there wasn't eyes on that crash, can you imagine the stories that could have, you know, manifested from that event if there wasn't like official people coming out first and saying, no, it was an F-35, but experimental aircraft go down all the time. I've been personally, um, my time in the Air Force, I was on several crash and recovery missions for the Air Force. And I know very well the, the details that go along with that program. And I have the, the awards to go with it because when you're part of a program like that, you get, you know, awarded. You get like a ribbon. You get like, it's called a Achievement Awards, what it's called in the Air Force. And I have several of them from being associated on, you know, boots on the ground at crash. One of those crashes was right outside of Groom Lake. Uh, in, in 1999, where two F-15s collided, and we were out there for a week, and the people that showed us the crash sites were 51 personnel, like guards, that showed us the sites, and then we landed in helicopters and secured the sites for a week and lived out there. But during that time is where I, I think I said on one of these spaces that I witnessed you know, some type of technology that resembles what would be, I guess, considered the Tic Tac you know, technology. But the guys I was with, were from the 117 projects, F-117 projects at, you know, at the Tonopah test range. And they were like, what was that? And we all kind of chopped it up as like some either laser guided drone technology or something, you know, but none, none of us were like, oh my God, those are aliens. We're like, oh, that's some impressive war tech. That's probably going to come out in the future, you know? And it goes back to the Nimitz incident where you have this, what we call in the Air Force, a real world applications um, test where you, you roll technology out in a real world scenario, still controlled environment and see what the reactions are. And then if it, you know, you kind of adjust your uh, development program from that and, and shift fire of, of what to do and what to make the technology better. So I'm assuming that's kind of what happened with you know, all these leaks with the videos and stuff, because when it comes to Lou Elizondo, you know, he comes out and he somehow these, the, the, the videos end up in Christopher Mellon's hands in the Pentagon park parking lot. Well, okay. That's federal property. And that's federal property that was given to technically a civilian at the time. So there's, I'm assuming there's probably a criminal investigation it's probably still ongoing with that, which is why air force OSI was initially involved because that was air force, government property you know the pentagon has their own special task force for detectives and stuff to do investigations but it was air force osi who took the investigation which means that tells me that that was air force property that was leaked that they assumed was alien in nature and rolled with it 
And uh, so, I, I don't know, it's just been kind of a weird circle. And I respect everybody, but I grovel to none. So I don't, you know, when, when people ask me questions, I answer as honestly as I can. And I'm not going to lie to you, I'm very direct uh, when it comes to this topic, because I have been on the outs inside looking out my whole career. And I have friends, I have a friend right now, he's moving out here uh, next week, who, same background as me. And he does not follow this topic at all. So I can't wait to really introduce him to, you know, get, get his thoughts and insights on this world as well. Cause I'm very curious to see his reaction. Yeah. I, I wish I could be a fly on the wall when that went down. Uh, Shane, you have your hand up for a while. What's, what's up? Yeah. Um, I just want to say something. Um, you guys are listening to Chris talk. Uh, Chris worked for Area 51. He worked for Janet Flights, he worked the DOE, and he worked at Skinwalker Ranch, and probably something I'm forgetting because he worked for so many places. Um, you can go to other spaces and you can hear whistleblowers, you can hear whatever, but you all love Area 51, you all love Skinwalker Ranch, you all love all these things. This fucking guy worked for all of this stuff, and he's the most base fucking dude you'll ever hear from. What more, and I'm sorry, Chris, I do this every time he talks because he's very humble. What more do you fucking want? Like, what more could me or Lou or, or Matt do um, other than have someone who is the most credentialed guy come in here and talk about this? He's talking about his friends that work the same programs and how they weren't involved in this, but he, that they've seen some crazy human tech. You know, like, it's fascinating. It's, it's, uh, I'm loving that part, Chris. Well, I do have a question about that. You said laser guided drone system that looked like a tic tac. When you yeah. said it looked like a tic tac, did it look exact like with the appendages? That's a really good question. And everything? It, it, we were pretty far away from a distance. It looked like like a very small shaped, yeah, like a tic tac, but it was a long ways away, and uh, it made very quick maneuvers. And one went down. There was two of them that were in the sky, and uh, one went down, one went up, and. It, it's interesting some of the procedures how they use how they test technology out at the Nevada at the test site. But uh, Chris, do you think they were observing, or because you said one went down, one up, one went up, and I'm thinking like were they floating there, there just, and then they ascended and descended? Like, do you think they were observing? What do you say? I think it was just a test flight, basically. You know, and that's what people don't understand. Like, remember 2019 Storm Area 51? You know, I have friends that work out there, and you know, I'm talking to them, and they're pissed because of the amount of overtime they had to. They had to work during that event, but people need to understand that event caused a little of uh, Air Force operations where they couldn't fly sorties or tech or anything in the sky, which translates into millions of dollars wasted in government money. And when they waste government money because people are fantasizing about aliens being out there, they probably were like, okay, it's about enough of this stuff, you know, and I'm sure that kind of drew some attention because at the end of the day, uh, Air 51 is a test Air, Air Force. It's an Air Force base where they test technology, which is used for air power global dominance. And that is essentially the overall objective when it comes to this type of stuff, you know, and, um, uh, I don't know. It, for me, as a young airman, I must have been, you know, I think I was 22 at the time. It was kind of like, wow, that was pretty cool. But it, it wasn't like, even now, if I saw that out there, I wouldn't like blow the blow the whistle and be like, oh my God, I saw a UFO. As I was like, oh, that's obviously some very new technology that's being tested, you know? Yeah, and I, I just want to say, because, um, Oh, God damn it, Chris. You are always the best uh, to listen to um, because if you're not lying, um, you know, you can join the, this and Jolly's in the space right now. And I don't know. It just hurts me that like you, we literally like what you're looking for in ufology is someone like Chris, someone who worked in these departments and that tells you the truth. But it's not it's not as fantastic as you want it to be, I guess. So you just you just lean towards the fantastic, which is mostly bullshit. Um, and so when, when you come up, Chris, and you talk, man. It just blows me away that you don't have, you deserve fucking 30,000 people in here listening to you, man. I, I really just, I just love the, the fact that even though you don't get that, I'll fight for it every day. Um, but I love the fact that you bring reality to this topic as I guess the best I can put it. Well, I appreciate that. You know, at the end of the day, I, I kind of picture fast forward the future. What am I leaving for my kids? And it was just really a story to tell them about some cool places I worked at to maybe inspire them to always be, um, um, 
to be aggressive in their dreams because he's willing to work at like this elite level for the Air Force and stuff like that when it comes to special pro and it, and I messed up and I manifested that reality. So, you know, I've said before in some of these spaces, I'm also very grounded in spirituality that my mother, you know, she she's Cherokee, so she raised me very spiritual as a young kid and taught me to meditate when I was like 12 years old. And that's something I've always kind of kept myself grounded, which I dove more into when I was on Skinwalker was the meditation and the spiritual side of the house. But when it comes to like the 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 background and the my professional background it's always been in this world of like you know securing sites and securing technology and and that type of stuff so and that's why a lot of these people um i like to meet people in person and 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 engage their bullshit meter in person and you know i think somewhere Somebody talked about it in a podcast, I think with Lou, I think it was Jeremy McGowan that told you about how I, I met Jay Stratton in uh, September of last year. And that was a whole operation that I put together, not telling anybody, you know, they asked me to come out there in PhenomenCon to be a guest speaker and I turned it down. And I wanted to kind of catch people, not off guard, but I wanted to be an observer. And cause for me, this is very personal, everything. And so, and I, and I ran into Jay Stratton and we had a very good cordial conversation and some things were said that I'll keep between me and him. And, and I felt actually pretty good after the conversation. I actually, I actually did get a little bit of closure, um, but there's still some things that need to be closed and, I, and I'm working on that. But I like to meet people in person and, and talk to them because uh, I'm not hiding. I mean, I guess I could make up a bunch of stories. And when it came to Skinwalker Ranch, that first year out there, you know, I was second guessing a lot of stuff and and reporting things that some that, you know, I'm like, you know, the second week out there alone, you start kind of second guessing reality. You know, you get cabin fever and you're like, am I seeing this? Is this really what I'm, you know, so some of my reports are probably, you know, most of my reports are pretty boring, <laughs> honestly. But I, like, I didn't like to report stuff unless I had a second witness or actual evidence. Because at the time, I had an active pew clearance. And I was not going to lose that clearance over just BS stories, you know. Not saying everybody's stories out there were BS because there is something strange out there, you know. And, and that's why I like to go back out there because I'm still kind of putting those pieces together. But for me, it's not about entertainment. Even though, yeah, I appeared on the TV show and, you know, I've been asked to be on Blind Frog Ranch and all these other places. And I go out there as an advisor because I'm talking about the Native American history and the importance of that culture. What they, what we consider the phenomenon, they consider their culture. And there is a connection there. You know, these indigenous tribes these indigenous tribes went to these locations, observed something, and then spiritually evolved with that and then put that into their cultures, whatever that might've been. Was it a natural phenomenon that they construed as something different? Maybe so, or maybe it was something different. I don't know, but I, I, I kind of root myself in a couple different, you know, worlds, the spiritual side, and then also my professional background. So I, that does, I guess, make me unique when it comes to the people's insights, uh, when it comes to this topic. Well, it could also have been that peace pipe they might've been smoking. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, well, those are the things I want to dive into. I'm interested to hear the, um, you know, I know that you've been to DC a few times, three times, as a matter of fact, and, and you've, I know one of the things that you had a big potential beef with was being tested on with possible energy weapons without your permission. And, and the the some of the scans that Gary Nolan had shown on I believe it was Ross Coulthard's program. Um, did you confirm was, whether or not those scans? It was, were uh, it, was uh, uh, it was on Tucker Carlson's program. Oh, Tucker um, Carlson, that's right. But did those, you confirm if those brain scans were actually yours? Those brain scans were not mine. However, the document that it came from has my MRI data attached to that document. That's why I recognized it because I recognized that document. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute, what is this? And I'm like, what is he talking about? MRI scans. I'm like, wait a minute, I had an MRI done in 2011. And then that kind of sent me down a path too, where I found out that my brain scans data ended up on some PowerPoint presentation and who that was presented to. I'm still, I already know who it was, but I'm kind of just waiting to see the chips fall. But it's completely illegal, immoral, and ethical. Bottom, bottom line is you can't, you can't take, you know, civilian employees, have them get an MRI and then not tell them exactly what the purpose of the MRI is for and then not give them a copy of the MRI. 
And that's exactly what happened in 2011. But anyways, uh, I want to do your show maybe here in a couple of weeks. I got to take off right now and take my son to go get some some food, I guess. He's hungry. Yeah. Yeah, man. Dude. Hell yeah, I appreciate dude. it, Chris. Thanks for coming on, man. No and yeah, get at me. Let me know when when's a good time. I, I, I would love to see, dive deep into these, uh, these discussions. And maybe I'll have a new guy with me that might provide some real insight as well because – It'd be refreshing to hear his his take. Oh that. my god, that would be a lot of fun. Yeah, it That'd would be. be a lot of fun. All right, man. Well, thanks a lot, guys, uh, and everybody, take care. All right, Chris. Thank you, Matthew. You were pretty quiet throughout that. Uh, any thoughts on uh, on some of the things Chris said? You know, like I, I talked to Chris a long, long time ago. He probably wouldn't remember. It was on Reddit, and I don't even know what name I was using at the time because you know I like to change my names for various reasons. <laughs> Um, but no, like he's always fascinated me and I, I, I like, I like his spiritual aspect of it. That's more fascinating to me than anything that Fugle or Bigelow has ever had to discuss, you know? Um, yeah, I don't know. I, he's always been a fascinating guy and always seems very honest. I'm, I'm right there with you. Uh, Shane, you got your hand up. Then we'll, wait, go, what, what were you saying? Were you saying something, Matt? Matt? Oh, no, no. Oh, I think I'm echoing for some reason. That's weird. Um, Shane, you have your hand up, and then we'll go to Frank, who just popped in. Yeah, I just want to say that, um, uh, you know, Lou, me and you were both lost in the sauce at one point, right? You know, Lou, you were there when I flipped. And, you, and, you know, we have that gift we send everyone of Die Hard. Welcome to the party, pal. Um but Chris was one of the big reasons that I even had that flip. I uh, Someone asked me about it earlier, uh, why I had my flip, and I forgot to mention Chris, and I feel so bad about it because I just wanted to talk to some fucking body that actually really did have the credentials to talk about these programs, and he is the best guy you can talk to. And uh, my grandmother's 100% Cherokee, um, so when I hear him talk about like respecting indigenous cultures and stuff like that, I love it, you know? Uh, my grandmother was uh, brainwashed by uh, um, they had these schools on the reservation that would um, um, like tell them about Jesus and stuff and, and make them forget their, their teachings. And my grandmother is very much a victim of that. And she's 100 percent Cherokee. Like my grandma is straight up a Native American um, and I love her to death. But she'll tell you about Jesus. But she tells you anything about her, her culture. Um, but. You know, I come across in these spaces. Everyone in here knows me. You know, everyone in here knows who I am and what I stand for, I guess. Um, not trying to do my own horn or nothing, but I mean, I talk to spaces all the time. So this is what it is. But the one person that I could ever talk to about this stuff is Chris. Um, when I got arrested and I went through that trouble, he's a police officer. He told me, Shane, don't even worry about that because I feel like I let him down. Um, and he was like, don't even worry about it, man. You know, like we all have struggles. And um, he's, Someone that like, you know, like he's offered to come have a beer with me. Um, he has my, he's just a good fucking guy. And I just find it fascinating that um, we follow the CFO topic so closely. And then you have like whistleblowers. But then you have someone like Chris who like, you could literally consider him a whistleblower. I'm by the standards that we set uh, loosely as whistleblowers in this community. This dude's just telling you everything, um, truthfully, as he saw it the best he can. Um, and I find it fascinating that people would rather listen to, for lack of a better word, goddamn nonsense than someone like him who has worked in these programs. And he's he's not, he's worked for Area 51. He's worked for the Janet Flights. He's worked for Skinwalker Ranch. He's worked for DOE. It's an insane resume. And while you shouldn't take people's credentials so far, you should look at what they, um, if they follow the circle of confirmation or like Stephen Candy calls the wacky proof maneuver, or if they're trying to tell you exactly what they actually can see the best of capabilities. And I think that Chris is the Ori Calcum standard for that. And um, the fact that he comes here and talks and I've had, I've had him be, I've had people talk to him. I've had him in my spaces a lot, you know, like some of the biggest space I've ever held was Chris. And I've had people, challenge him i've had people agree with him or whatever and he's just there for it you know and um the fact that he talks about his kids and stuff like that is very true he always mentions that he's like you know um, i asked him one time same thing you asked him Lou. i said well like, why haven't you done 
go back and do proof maneuver, right? Like, why haven't you done a circle of confirmation? And he told me, he said, well, I could have, um, but I think back on my kids and he, dude, Chris works every day as a federal police officer, right? Like I've talked to Chris while he's at work all the time. And he's like, I just think back, like, I don't want my kids to, to ever have a doubt in my uh, integrity. And that just speaks volumes to me. I think the dude is a fucking hero. Um, he's a veteran of my country. And I think he's, I think he's great. I just honestly, I think he's literally the one guy everyone should talk to. And the best part about him is that you can talk to him. Um, because a lot of these other heroes and stuff, they're very sparse. But Chris, if you message Chris and, and want him to come in, he'll make time for you. And he'll come in and talk to you whether you agree with him or disagree with him. He is the absolute epitome of, um, I'm not, man, I really am trying to build him up because he's the best. If, if what, if you've ever heard me talk and you trust me at all, then I want you to trust that that dude that just spoke, Chris Bartell, is the absolute ultimate standard that we should hold everyone in UFO Twitter to. Um, and I mean that from the heart. And that's all I really have to say. All right. UFO Shane, everybody. Um... Frank, what do you got? And by the way, Lou, I talked to Chris uh, Chris Bledsoe this morning. I'm, I'm basically anointed. His dick grew three inches bigger today. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Chris, Chris summoned uh, the lady, and she was like, "We shall make your penis three sizes larger." And I was like, "Oh shit!" Like the Grinch's heart, bro. <laughs> yeah, Frank. I see you're unmuted. What, what do you think? He disconnected, dude. Oh, disconnected. Um, hey, Lou. What, what do you think about um, Chris Bledsoe healing someone at the pool of uh, Contact in the Desert of the Deafness? Um, I, I think it's probably BS. <laughs> you know. You know, I have that video up on YouTube because I, I so. Bledsoe was watching, and it was pretty amazing to watch. It was a meteorite go by and SpaceX at the same time. And <laughs> I just happened to have clicked on it, and I was—I I just started listening to say crazy shit, and I was like, oh, fuck yeah, record. You know, like, screen record, fuck it. And the shit that came out of that dude's mouth, like, saying, oh, my God, this is a sign from, from your dead yes! dog. Yeah, like... That's like all anybody should ever have to see about that shit bag. Like bringing up someone's dead daughter and like attributing, like like he can speak to them. That's fucked up. That's like traumatic. Well, there's not only that, Matt. There's also him um, having people send him uh, locks of their children's hair to cure diabetes. Okay, now that's just um, it's wild. Yeah, I, I've talked to that person, and their daughter is still still has uh, diabetes. By the way, I would imagine so. Yeah, it's not like. Uh, Easily curable, especially. Could you imagine like, walking into your child's room, cutting a lock of their hair, and sending it to some dude on Facebook, and then be like, "Bless them with the lady's power." I don't know. It's just, it's so wild to me. Did yeah. he charge him to do that? Um, I think it was like three hundred and fifty dollars. That is wild. Oh yeah, that's that's absolutely nuts. Jacobs asking uh, asking Emma Woods to send her draw. Yeah. Like, just people are fucked up. It gets wild out here, dude. But, you know, I used to believe in all this shit, Matt. Um, I used to believe in all this shit, dude. And it's... it's it, it sucks. It sucks. Hey, Shane, did you ever talk to uh, Andres about your, your experience? I did, and we had a... Lou, you're echoing so bad. Oh, sorry. I don't know what's going on there. Um, you have a good setup, Lou. You need to fix that. Um, maybe get an Elgato. I don't know. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, no, I did. Uh, Andreas is uh, – you introduced me to him, Lou, and he's always there on my shows. Always, I always co-host him because he brings personality. But, yeah, and he said that he had, like, a similar uh, – you know what? I can read it. Um, but I had a whole discussion with him about it, and it was insane. And um, he's also, like, so supportive in DMs to me that it's wild. Like, when I'm struggling or I'm having bad pains, like, here it says, he's like, don't ever be ashamed or feel shitty. 
about asking for help. That's one thing he's told me. Um, ah, I can't get back to it quick enough, I don't think. Hold on. Um, real quick, hold on. I'm trying to find it. Oh, dude, I don't know what's going on, but I can't um, load the DMs before we talk about Eric Von Anakin. But, yeah, I did talk to him um, in DMs about it, and he said that, you know, he also um, had, like, a similar type of experience. And he asked me about, like, um, if I thought it was my mother or um, what it is. And I just told him straight up, I was like, I don't really care anymore. Like, I don't think it was my mom. Personally, I know a lot of people tell me that it was. And he said that was, like, pretty healthy to do. Um, but, he, you know, the best thing he did was he didn't deny it. Um, at all and uh i think he's a great fucking guy but yeah i had i've had some pretty in-depth conversations so i want to keep them private to be honest with you because it's kind of like um it's for me but uh yeah he's been nothing but supportive and also very rational as well that's awesome man i'm happy to hear that that's good shit no he's a great resource uh, especially if you're struggling on any level with the phenomenon or what you perceive as a phenomenon. I would highly recommend Did you know he has two master's degrees? Yep. That's crazy. Yeah. No, that's why he's he's an amazing resource, and that's why I, uh, I value his opinions uh, greatly. Because, yeah, I mean, anytime we can bring in somebody with that kind of uh, expertise – especially to the abduction discussion and the, you know, the experience phenomena. I oh, dude, his breakdown on hypnosis is yeah. absolutely wild and it's stunning. So How so many good. stories involve fucking hypnosis, Lou? How all many? Of, yeah, all of them. All of them, dude. Of them. And then you talk all to someone them. with two master's degree and they're also rational and he'll tell you about like how that can be a very dangerous thing. That's why I love the chat that you and Matt and him were having earlier about the picks or the or staging someone to be ready for that. Absolutely fucking amazing. Yeah, no, it, it's it was cool. Well, on that note, you guys, it's been a three hour space. I think we're gonna end it here. Uh, this is a let's really go for cool twelve more hours. Kill it, uh, burn it with fire. What's what you say? <laughs> burn it with fire. Yeah, that's what that's what I, you know. Speaking of burning things with fire, this last week, this last week I've been uh, privileged enough to play some video games. I got back into some video games that I've been playing Days Gone on PlayStation Four. What a great game! Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. I, I played it when it came out, and I didn't really like it. And I got back into it because it was only twelve bucks, I think, on on PlayStation. And I'm having a blast. You live. It's, it's a lot of fun. Lou. So. Me and yeah. you, live streaming on Twitch, Hell Divers 2, dude. I'll buy you the game. It's not on the it's not on PlayStation yet. But you just have to have a computer. You have a fucking badass PC, I know you do. Oh no, no, I don't. I have a Mac. Well guess what? Guess what, Lou? I can send you a program that will allow you to run Hell Divers 2 on. Okay, man, send me the program. <laughs> it's already done. Alright, awesome. Alright, well you guys thanks so much for everyone's uh, input and participation uh again we'll be doing more of these with matt uh matt what other books are, are, are we going to get into with you can you can you think of any off the top of your head i don't know man i there's there's a ton i don't know he's, he's better read than me i don't remember shit from being gone for a while but um yeah i don't know we'll figure something out well, Steve, let's get in here next week, if we can, with Steve Long, and again with you, Matt. Let's dive into some more lore. Dude, I'm, I'm Team Steve Long all day. I could, I could listen to him talk all day. I love him. So, yeah, I'm down. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. I'm right I want to wash his feet. <laughs> yeah. Not before me, buddy. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> I'll All get right, the left, guys. but you get the right. Have a, have a great rest of your yeah. week. We'll see you tomorrow on Lou Reviews. We're, we're going to go over Tim Gallaudet and all sorts of fun stuff. So uh, until tomorrow. Well, Lou, uh, Lou, when are we doing this show with me on there? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, soon, buddy. Soon. Probably in the next month or so. I'm ready. All right. Cheers, everyone. I, I know you are. <laughs>